At the beginning of 2012, BioWare released an end to their Mass Effect trilogy after four and a half years. The game promised a satisfying conclusion to a beloved series of games. It promised that all of these characters that you got to know and appreciate would have their stories conclude to some degree. It promised that all of the potential paths which you had chosen throughout the other two games would impact your experience in a way that was unique to your playthrough. It was one of the most anticipated releases that I had ever waited for with bated breath. One that had me pre-ordering the collector's edition of the game. And it delivered everything that I expected. Until it didn't. The characters that I had grown fond of had many of their stories wrapped up. The threat that had plagued the galaxy went from looming in the background to making itself known in a terrifyingly powerful way. And yet the last sensation that I had about Mass Effect 3 was that it concluded the trilogy on such a lukewarm note that I never decided to play it again in the decades since its release. It's a puzzling sensation because I have a lot of memories from the game that are positive. Many of the big story events and the direction that a lot of the companions wound up taking were such highlights that I remember those scenes as if I played the game yesterday. And yet for years now, there were only three things that really came to my mind instantly when someone mentioned Mass Effect 3. Red, blue, and green. It's a conclusion that really stained the game for me, and I wasn't alone on that take. The backlash against Bioware was so heavy that they wound up pushing out an extended cut DLC to try to flesh out the ending a little bit more. But ultimately, that didn't actually change too much with what happened in each choice. The admonishment towards this ending was so strong that petitions were formed and signed. Red, blue, and green cupcakes were sent to the Bioware offices. And death threats were made against individual Bioware employees. Which is the most moronic thing I've ever heard, and I'll never understand the headspace that you have to be in to send a death threat to someone over a video game. But my dive into the former two games has led to this. And I have to wonder if I was too harsh on Mass Effect 3 back when it released. I've never seen the extended cut. I've never played the DLC or know what it does to help this game's shortcomings. So in this video, I'm going to be taking another more forgiving in some ways and more critical in others look at Mass Effect 3. I'll be evaluating its mechanics, its plot points, how well it ties into the previous two games, and whether I think it's overall worth playing or not. Before I begin, I'll note that I'm going to be continuing to play on the Legendary Edition because the second game's save is already there, and all of the DLC is already packed into it with no hassle. I also have another sponsor with this plate that will show up about halfway or so through the video, so try not to be too alarmed. And finally, I kind of have a brief question just because this feels like the finale of the series for me, but do you think that Andromeda is worth covering? I know there's been a lot of press about it since its release, but I don't really know if it's actually worth, you know, going over like I do. But yeah, I guess it was just something that popped into my mind. Alright, let's get to it. So right away the game allows me to import my Shep as you might expect. It also allows me to choose a new class for him if I want, which is something that I don't really need to cover as thoroughly in this video, seeing as each class is nearly identical to the previous game's classes. So with that in mind, I'm going to stick with Vanguard like I did in Mass Effect 2, just because I enjoyed its aggressive playstyle quite a lot. And now we begin soon after the events which took place in the Arrival DLC from the last game, in which Shepard destroyed a relay in order to stave off the Reaper threat for a little longer. Since then, Shepard's been grounded on Earth for a sort of probation period which has had him getting used to a more normal lifestyle. Of course, that doesn't last long, as one of the game's companions marches in to tell Shepard that something urgent has transpired. After walking with Anderson and briefly meeting up with Caden, it soon becomes apparent that the Reapers are close to Earth. Of course, the Earth Defense Force here is about as slack-jawed as the Citadel Council, and they grill Shepard about the Reapers as if the guy hasn't literally been waving his arms and screaming about them since the first game. Well, they start listening to him right around the time the Reapers land on Earth and, uh, begin wholesale obliterating it. Which, unsurprisingly, uh, might be a little too late. Thankfully, no one important dies, and Shep and Anderson begin marching their way towards the Chaos to get to the Normandy. The leveling system shows its slight overhaul immediately when pausing to look at the menus, as I start at the same level that I ended up with in the second game, along with the same skill points. This presents a minor problem, as I wound up sinking points into incendiary ammo in the second game just because I didn't know where else to spend them. Since Mass Effect 3 gives my class two new skills, along with a cap of six on prior skills instead of four, I now had things that I would have spent those incendiary points on. So what I wound up doing was backing out, firing up Mass Effect 2, resetting my skills, and importing my character again. 
It's not really the game's fault, but uh, I guess it would have been nice for the devs to consider that new skills might mean that people want to respec and redistribute their points at the start of the game. Especially when I couldn't find any way of skipping the eight or so minute introduction sequence. It is worth noting that you can respec much later after a couple of hours on the Normandy, but I didn't realize that until I got to that point. Our new skills encompass the likes of Fitness, which gives me more health, shields, and melee damage, and Nova, which is basically another biotic attack which uses my shields to inflict massive damage, further playing into that high-risk, high-reward style of combat that Vanguard is known for. I'm interested in both of these, especially since my companion unlocked skill is now gone from the previous game. My end goal is to be able to charge enemies, blast them with Nova, and then charge them again to basically regain my shields. Either way, let's jump into what combat and exploration looks like on our way to the Normandy. So the second game's ammo system is still in effect as it has you picking up these cooling cartridges to make sure that your gun can still fire without overheating itself. I never really explained this in my second video because I didn't actually look into it until later when some comments pointed it out. But in the first game, the lore was that ammo wasn't a thing because technology had come far enough to invent weapons that use a Mass Effect shield, basically firing tiny metal shavings the size of a grain of sand, making the need for ammo cartridges a thing of the past. This also meant that if you fired your gun too quickly, it would overheat and need to cool down. Mass Effect 2 made it so that the guns got rid of the internal cooling system in favor of thermal clips, which meant that guns wouldn't overheat, but would have to be quote-unquote reloaded. There's actually an entire conversation later on in this game detailing the criticism that Bioware got for this shift, explaining the change away as something that made sense. I think I saw some guys fighting over a thermal clip. A what? A thermal clip. They stop weapons from overheating. Sorry, just a joke. Wait, where do these thermal clips come from? I thought weapons cooled down. They used to. After the Geth attack a few years back, we switched to thermal clips. Well, that sounds like a major step backward. <laughs> you might as well be going back to limited ammunition. It's not ammunition, Conrad. I just don't think it's a very good idea. I'll be sure to let every military organization in the galaxy know that. What it sounds like to me is that some higher up at EA or Bioware decided that RPGs don't sell as well as action shooters. And what's an action shooter without ammo cartridges? Yeah, either way, the whole combat system is about the same as it was in the last entry with the addition of combat rolling. I wound up rolling more accidentally than intentionally, since Bioware still hadn't figured out how to not bind use, sprint, cover, and roll all to the same fucking key for some reason. Honestly, the whole thing at this stage feels like a Gears of War game, which is probably what the devs were going for. And while I did enjoy Gears of War, it feels like Mass Effect has definitely lost its identity combat-wise from game to game. Exploration is a bit more involved as you can now hurdle gaps in addition to the levels having a bit of verticality to them now which has Shepard dropping off of predetermined ledges and climbing up ladders rather than having to find a slope to ascend or descend. It's not anything incredible, but I guess it's still nice to see. Honestly though, even though the environment is a lot more dynamic, it's now hit that stage where I can literally see the path that I'm going to follow when the wreckage falls perfectly into ramps, bridges, and very obvious crossing areas. While I do agree that the former games had an issue with everything needing to have a ramp to ascend, it never really bothered me in the way that watching rubble turn into terrain that I can traverse bugs me. Either way, let's jump back to the part where Earth is ravaged and billions are dying. So Anderson and Big Shep run through these buildings with no one in them besides this one child who slithers out from a vent like a mysterious snake vendor before retracting further into certain death. I'm assuming that the other humans here have been thoroughly huskified as husks are now roaming around the area in droves. I'm not a huge fan of how cheesy some of this dialogue is. And while this did happen occasionally in Mass Effect 2, it happens almost immediately in 3. Take my hand. You can't help me. It's hard enough fighting a war, but it's worse knowing no matter how hard you try, you can't save them all. Exactly. Yeah, that's definitely some dialogue that you would hear in this merry jaunt through the burning wreckage. It certainly wouldn't be something along the lines of, oh god, oh fuck, shit, 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 hurry, get through the wreckage, the building's gonna collapse, fuck, shit, god, fuck. After blasting through a few waves of Reaper forces, the Normandy arrives and Anderson goes, hey, look. I know the Council has historically never listened to you about anything, ever, 
but you need to go alone, while I, the former ambassador of humanity to the council, stay behind and help a couple of soldiers. Uh, first off, what the fuck? Second of all, that's really stupid. So it's up to Shepard, Caden, and James Vega to head over to the council to try to flag them down for help. I've historically regarded this introduction to the game as one of the most powerful intros to a game ever, but I don't think it really hits the same when rewatching it, unfortunately. I mean, yes, it's very cool and heavy to a degree to watch the Reapers land and demolish Earth. Yes, this music is absolutely spot on, and this particular song is one of my favorites from the series. It was one of the first songs that I heard, and it really made me think about video game music differently. But I think that knowing what happens definitely reduces the impact of it all, as I found myself more put off by Anderson staying behind than I felt bad about watching the vessel containing the Snake Boy from before getting shot to shit. On our way out of Earth's orbit, we get a message from Admiral Hackett ordering us to make a pit stop on Mars for some information that will help us against the Reapers. I'll get to the personalities and stories behind Caden, Vega, and everyone else that we pick up in the companion analysis later. So for now, all you really need to know is that we're here on Mars to pick up both the information and Liara, who will be rejoining us for this game. The first thing that really makes itself known is the weight system, which I actually find to be an interesting addition to this game. So it isn't your standard system where every metagel weighs 0.5 weight, and instead only takes your weapon loadout into consideration. And even then, it still allows you to equip as much as you want, more or less, but at the expense of how quickly or slowly your powers regenerate. This is at the expense of stripping down class restrictions, allowing for any class to equip the five main weapon types if a player chooses. So if you're going for a full-on biotic power build, you're not going to want to bring too many heavy weapons so that your powers can regen faster. But if you're just a soldier who wants to shoot the baddies, then it's likely that you won't really care about how fast your powers regenerate. I actually kind of dig it, as it made me decide right then and there whether or not I wanted to try out the whole dash and smash build, or to spring for bringing my combat rifle in addition to my shotgun and pistol. I wound up going for the former to give my hypothesis here a try. Yeah, the whole dash and blast combo is stupidly overpowered, and it makes my game footage look ridiculous. I don't even think I need weapons most of the time. So it turns out that Cerberus has gotten through Shepard's breakup with them, and is now taken to executing the people on Mars for reasons unknown to us right now. Caden still hasn't quite gotten over the idea that Shepard was working with Cerberus at one point, and immediately starts grilling Shep for the reason why Cerberus is here. Shepard. I need a straight answer. About what? Do you know anything about why Cerberus is here? What makes you think I know what they're up to? You work for them, for God's sakes. How am I not supposed to think that? My brother in Christ, we just slaughtered them. What makes you think that we're still on good terms? I mean, to be fair to Caden, I think he's just lashing out and trying to wrap his head around Earth being invaded in addition to the past emotional trauma of Shep not calling him after being resurrected, but... I don't know, we'll, we'll talk more about Caden's mistrust later. After we make it to the archives here, we watch as Liara is scrambling through the ventilation system as two Cerberus soldiers chase her. She doesn't use her pistol or powers yet for some reason, but it's okay because the soldiers have Stormtrooper aim. When she makes it out, she remembers that she has powers, or she now has room to cast the hand signs required to throw out a pole singularity or something. And then she shoots them with zero remorse, which is fun to watch as it really cements her more matured and less starry-eyed personality that she's taken on. She goes on to state that she's found a potential way to defeat the Reapers locked away in Mars's archives, which she defines as a Prothean blueprint for a device to disable the Reapers. Since Cerberus is on a permanent mission to establish humanity as the reigning species, they also want their hands on that device. So this has now become a race to the center of this Tootsie Pop which Shepard and the gang obviously win. This whole ordeal has us making our way through the Cerberus troops, figuring out that a double agent let them in, and discovering that they've been experimenting on their own soldiers with Reaper technology. Hello, this is Delta Team. 
Anybody there? Is this Commander Shepard? Well, I- You literally have the most recognizable voice in the entire galaxy. Damn it. I knew I shouldn't have done all of those Citadel advertisements. This whole area is kind of a, hey, look how cool and action-packed the combat is now, sort of ordeal which becomes grating as the game continues to show off the staggering technology behind rolling from cover to cover, storming to safety, and crossing gaps in combat. I do like how these Cerberus dummies had the insight to blow up the tracks on the way over to them with explosives, but then they just sent another car on the opposite track to perfectly line up with our car. Really keeps me in the moment here and definitely doesn't feel like a Call of Duty campaign level. So we make our way to the core of this thing, and the elusive man pops his wrinkled ass in to gloat about how Shepard's too late and has a low IQ. Basically, Cerberus sees this as an opportunity to harvest the Reaper's technology, and not to just destroy them. Of course, this is all a stall for time as his agent is uploading the data while deleting it from the archive. We wind up tracking her down to somewhere close nearby, before a scripted chase sequence occurs which has her scrambling around like a Scooby-Doo character. It's really aggravating when a game is this obvious about an unwinnable event, as I literally have the tools to charge her down, only for her to wiggle her legs around like a Fall Guys bean and magically teleport 15 feet ahead of where she was. Whatever, I guess. When we make it topside, she jumps into a shuttle, James kamikazes her, and she pops out and grabs Caden by his Morrowind NPC-shaped head and bashes it against the shuttle. I take down her T-1000 ass before picking her up like a suitcase and escaping Mars. And now it's off to the Citadel for a rousing round of getting rejected by the Council for the 43rd time in these games. Oh yeah, and to make sure that Caden doesn't have a Texas-sized hole in his head. The Citadel isn't as fun as it was in the previous entries, at least not yet, as my only options right now are to go to the hospital or the Council area. Fortunately, the hospital at least has a little shopping kiosk which allows me to upgrade my Metagel capacity and to teach my Pokémon the Peruvian whiskey move. So at least that was fun. Visiting Caden is… I don't know, it, it feels forced here. Like, as much as I'm not a huge fan of Ashley, I do think that with Male Shep, she probably would have had the better scene here just due to the potential romance in the first game. As things stand, Caden and Shepard have not been on great terms for a long time now, and seeing Shepard deliver these heartfelt lines feels like a little too much. Had this sequence occurred later in the game after the two had patched up their friendship, I would have felt a little better about it. But either way, that's all there really is to do here. Let's get this shit show on the road. So the first big thing to note here is that Udina is now the counselor to Earth. While this may be a small thing, it's also the first of a string of decisions which are overridden or tossed aside in this game. I chose Anderson to be the counselor, but the devs wrote in that he got tired of it and went back to serving Earth's alliance, which explains his presence there. I don't want to raise hell about this particular point, but it does make me feel not very great about the pseudo option that I got to decide on at the end of Mass Effect 1. I think I would have felt a lot better if I had witnessed Anderson doing some cool things for the Council before this, maybe something that affected Mass Effect 2. He does reinstate your Spectre status if you didn't save the Council in the first game, but since I did save them, all I really got was a chat with him about Council life in the second game before he moved back to Earth. Either way, I remembered this whole ordeal being more of a circus than it actually is. Yes, Earth was attacked, but the Reapers are moving in on the planets of other races as well which means that everyone on the Council is watching out for their own people. It's funny because quite a few people pointed out to me that when I called Ashley xenophobic in the first game, that it turned out that she was right to be because the Council abandons humanity in this game. But it's not like the Reapers are all sitting in Earth's solar system just having a field day and playing baseball with Pluto. They sent a chunk of their forces to each of these systems and are wreaking havoc on every race that they can find. Of course the Council isn't going to just send their forces to help Earth. There are fires everywhere. Now I'm not saying that they're not incompetent, because they've definitely dismissed every warning about the Reapers that they could. But this whole idea that Ashley is right to distrust aliens because they would abandon humanity when their backs are against the wall is like saying that a certain country would abandon another in the same situation. And you know what? Maybe that's true to an extent. But treating every other space race like they're expendable is only ever going to result in that exact scenario unfolding instead of them remembering what you've done for them and banding together to help each other out. I will say that I've heard that Ashley gets a lot better in this game. 
I can't quite remember what goes on there, but I am willing to believe it. And I guess, since we're here, I totally misunderstood the analogy about the bear and the dog in the first game, and that's my bad. But I also think that it's a shitty analogy regardless, seeing as humans are much more intelligent than dogs. If you view alien races as peoples from different countries, it gets a lot more fucked up to think about abandoning one just because they're Italian or Puerto Rican or Japanese or so on. But I know that a lot of people see that differently with the Ashley debacle, so I guess we'll just move on. So yes, the Council denies sending in forces to Earth because they want to secure their own borders first. I do find it funny that you bring up this idea that you have a potential weapon to destroy the Reapers. And the Council's like, oh shit, for real? Huh. Wow. Well, good luck with that. Like, that's a completely different thing that doesn't have anything to do with sending troops to Earth, and could have been done in the absence of sending help. Fortunately, the most annoying counselor, the Turian one, actually comes through and restores Shepard's Spectre status while dropping a hint that one of the Turian's leaders is under attack by the Reapers, and is currently in need of help. The trade-off is that if we help to rescue this guy, that he'd probably be willing to come help Earth with his fleet. So we scratch their backs and they scratch ours, which seems to be the only way that we're going to get out of this situation. I do wish that me literally saving the council from death would have counted as scratching their backs though. And that's really the biggest issue here. The devs wrote this game to play out exactly this way. Despite the fact that they could have written two whole separate storylines had they taken into consideration the fact that Shepard saved the council. And therefore the council should be grateful and help out humanity here. I know that I just said that they're doing what probably anyone would do, but this decision would have been amazing to watch unfold if someone carried their playthrough from game to game only to have it completely change how the last entry plays out. And realistically, it wouldn't even have to change what a lot of the gameplay looked like fundamentally. It just would have been nice if the council said, all right, Shepard, we'll do this for your people. I guess we'll just tally this up to another decision that didn't really matter as much as it should have in the end. I think the last thing that I want to touch on here before I ship out is just how well-rounded a lot of these side characters are in the final game. I know, it surprised me too. But the Turian counselor softening up even though he technically needed something was nice to witness. Udina had always been a hardened bastard, but he's really good in this time when billions are dying on Earth. And his rough edges proved to be really good to help lobby for Earth when he states that he's going to move mountains to get the funding that our anti-reaper weapon needs. Even the reporter, who's historically been a completely unsavory dickhead about literally everything that Shepard has done in the past, relents after Shepard assures her that he's doing everything in his power to help Earth. She admits that she's glad to have him on humanity's side, and encourages him to keep going, which is a cool direction for her character to take in the 11th hour. Heading back to the Normandy has us getting into another call with Haggett before getting to explore our now Alliance-flavored ship. What Hackett tells us directly relates to the big goal of this game, gaining resources and sending them to the Alliance in order to improve our odds against the Reapers. These are called war assets, and the amount that you gain come from smaller sources like seeing eye to eye with the reporter, or larger sources like saving the Turian leader. The amount of war assets that you gain affects how many endings that you can choose from as well as what happens in those endings. Since I won't be hitting every ending, obviously, I'll give a brief rundown of a few of the outcomes that could happen depending on the amount of war assets that you have here at the end of the game. On the low end, you only get one option that is directly related to what you chose at the end of Mass Effect 2, and it basically results in the Earth being all but destroyed. A little bit higher than that, and you get to choose between two options regardless of the second game's outcome. Even higher than that, and the endings that you choose now either inflict no damage or massive damage to the galaxy depending on what you decide to go for. And this goes on to encompass about a dozen ending world states which vary in their severity and tone. It is worth noting that the system has changes in the Legendary Edition, but I'll talk more about all of this towards the end of the video. It's definitely worth mentioning that Mass Effect 3 does do equipment a lot better than 2, as the game seems to combine the systems used in the first and second game into a hybrid that has you collecting weapons, weapon mods, and armor pieces at a pretty high rate. This was something that I criticized the second game for, as the amount of equipment was shockingly little when compared to the first game. So I do have to hand it to Mass Effect 3 here. They did pretty good. Weapons themselves vary more than their stat numbers, as some can fire different ammo rounds, some can be charged up, others can naturally penetrate walls and armor better, and so on. And even then, a lot of mods exist which bring these factors to the weapons that didn't have them in the first place. Additionally, you don't have to find multiple mods for each companion, as one mod will allow the whole squad to equip it if you want. 
Both the weapons and the mods can also be upgraded to rank 5, which brings back that idea from the first game and streamlines it to be less about random drops or shop inventory, and instead lets you choose which weapons you want to enhance. It's a really clean system that shows that a lot of thought was put into how this game's equipment should function, and I have to applaud Bioware here for it. After checking out the ship and chatting up the crew, it's time to check out the Galaxy Map Mark III. In this iteration, we don't have to probe planets for resources, and instead have a scanner which can send out pulses to find wreckage or planets with points of interest on them. You don't need to buy a load of probes and start shotgun blasting them into planets, and instead just fire one at a specific point on a planet that gives off a signal. Once you probe or salvage wreckage, you gain fuel, credits, upgrades, or war assets, encouraging you to continue to seek out these pockets of space. It feels a lot better than the system that was present in Mass Effect 2, and I'm overall pretty satisfied with it. But the biggest kicker is the threat of the Reapers, which are ever-present in various systems across the galaxy. When you go to probe in a system with a Reaper nearby, every pulse that's sent out causes the alertness bar to fill a bit further. When it fills all the way, Reapers enter the part of the galaxy map that you're in and begin to pursue you. This is fucking awesome, and terrifying. I absolutely love this facet of the game, and it adds so much more danger to just probing the way that you usually would. Though I do have to say that actually getting caught results in a game over screen without much else fanfare, so while the threat is there, the actual repercussions aren't horrific by any means. After exploring around for a bit and doing a pretty basic wave defense side quest, I head off to rescue that Turian leader. This has us warping into a full-on battle between the Turian fleet and the Reapers, as the Reapers are now ravaging the Turian homeworld as well. But please guys, come save Earth, am I right? Anyways, the drop-in has us taking out some husks before moving into the base camp that's set up here. The camp has a massive amount of equipment upgrades to grab, making it feel like the devs kinda just peppered them into the area. This actually extends to pretty much every part of the game. It's just constant picking up stuff every single time. Which, I mean, it's not horrible. It's just kind of weird because it's never really like hidden. It's not like, oh man, I went around this corner that I never would have went around otherwise and I happened to find this thing, whoa! It's just almost always like right in front of you. So I don't really know how I feel about it, but I guess you're constantly getting upgrades, just a constant flow of stuff. Any gamer's gonna appreciate that one. But either way, the overall feeling of being in the middle of this gigantic battle is really goddamn cool. Meeting with the General here results in us finding out that the Turian leader has died, and instead has us helping out these guys in the hope of salvaging a friendly relationship with this armada. God, there really is something to be said about this looming threat in the background of the moon that we're on. It really does make all of this so much more dramatic than very many of the missions in the previous games. We wind up fixing up a comms tower and blasting waves of husks before trotting back to the command center where the next in line for the leader role is determined. The guy's name is Victus, and he's out here somewhere fighting, so we gotta go grab him. Our boy Garrus shows up, who's been advising these guys on how to best stave off the Reapers. I had planned on taking him and Liara into the breach to pick up Victus, but forgot that this is the part where the Normandy begins to go haywire, and Liara volunteers to go figure out what's going on. So, more screen time for James, I suppose. I mean, it's really the only screen time he's ever gonna get in these missions. So we fight off a few more waves from areas that need defending, one of which has a literal turret section attached to it. Like I said, these guys were definitely told to or decided to make this game way more Call of Duty-like, and it feels really damn weird. Eventually, this brute drops in and charges the wall, and somehow that causes Shepard to just fall from behind a shielded turret. I, I don't know how either. But the brute looks like this, and dies like this. All right, now that we're done showcasing 2008 technology, let's actually go get this Victus guy. This trek goes about as you would expect, with some conversation sprinkled in about the Turian homeworld being under siege and the like. When we get to Victus and clear out the enemies, we approach him the exact way that you should approach someone who's only ever been a military man and nothing else. We go, hey, you gotta come with us for some diplomatic talks. Yeah, I'm sure that's gonna sit well with him. I like that. Oh, all right, cool then. One small hitch. We need the Krogan. I can't see us winning this thing without them. Get them to help us, and then we can help you. Yeah, this is how a lot of this game is set up. 
While you do constantly fight on various fronts to try to alleviate the pressure from the Reaper threat, you also have to delegate and tiptoe around centuries of political strife and conflict. The Krogans hate the Salarians and the Turians. The Asari aren't happy that you look towards the Krogans for help, and so on and so forth. To say that it's stupid is an understatement, but I don't mean that it's shitty writing. It's actually probably pretty accurate to how races with this much history might feel towards each other, and how they might just allow everything to be destroyed instead of uniting in the potential final hours of life everywhere. When we make it back to the ship, the situation with the ship's AI, Edie, is still going on. Upon investigation, it turns out that Edie had been trying to extract information from the android that juggled Caden like a bowling pin. This resulted in the android putting up a fight and Edie forcibly taking it over. And that's how new companions are made. I think this is probably a decent time to touch on how the quests are actually handled in this game. With the galaxy under siege, a lot of different distress calls and cries for help are naturally going to arise. And in an average game, you might expect to just be able to take all of it on at your leisure. But that's actually not true with Mass Effect 3, as a lot of quests actually have hidden timers in the background or only stick around until you progress past a certain mission. Way more of them exist in this game than the previous one, and I like the way that this is handled just because it makes sense and it adds a layer of replayability to those going in blind. That said, there is a path to take on all of your quests in one go if you know which ones have timers. I just wish that the game told you, hey, you have X amount of missions before this one goes away, or whatever. Either way, our first time-sensitive mission is to help out a school of very gifted biotic students who are currently in the process of being kidnapped by Cerberus. If the idea of a school of biotics rings any bells, you wouldn't be surprised by the fact that Jack is here, and with a new character model to boot. She's every bit the badass that she was before, and although she doesn't join your core group of squad members, her character has bloomed into one who's found her purpose in this galaxy, which is a far cry from how you found her. She's discovered something that she cares about at last, her students, and her teaching career has only helped her on a brighter path. It's fucking awesome, and the perfect end for her character arc in my opinion. Good to see you again, Garrus. It still looks like shit. So fighting our way out of here consists of the usual run and gun, but it does feel really good to hear all of the back and forth between Jack and her students while doing so. It elevates the combat to be about the best that it can be, and I enjoyed this side mission quite a lot. Of course, we have to run through every action game sci-fi trope, so we wind up climbing into a mech suit for the finale. But whatever. Escaping has us securing these students to use in the war, with you being able to assign them as frontline biotic artillery or as backline support for barriers. I have to say that all of my initial concern about the cheesy dialogue has thoroughly been dissolved at this stage, and these exchanges feel right in line with a well-scripted movie. Our next foray is going to be something that I actually have no experience with, as I've never played any DLC for Mass Effect 3. As always, this quest involves Cerberus, which has taken on the role of the 20 leagues of mercenaries that we had to constantly wade through in the previous entry. We're to head over to Eden Prime, which is where everything began in Mass Effect 1. Our goal is to recover another Prothean artifact in the hopes that it can help turn the tide somehow. Upon landing, we actually get the first and I think the only chunk of dialogue that I can recall from Shepard which relates to his background that you chose for him in the very first game. I mean, yeah, others have mentioned it to him occasionally, but he's never really seemed to bring up the idea that he was born and raised in a filthy Earth city as a street rat of his own volition until now. So that's a nice touch. Our next companion is a Prothean, one who's been in cryostasis for the last 50,000 years. We find his Gogurt tube, but without the signal to open it and some further data, we'd only kill him by squeezing him out. This leads to another rousing round of pin the plasma on the Cerberus soldiers, and gathering the tools to open the sarcophagus. I actually didn't realize it until now, but the hacking minigame is completely removed from this entry, as it's now done automatically when enemies aren't around firing at you. It's kind of interesting, I wonder if that was due to feedback, lack of time, or just a general decision to keep the players in the action. Regardless, Shepard is able to translate the signal that everyone else was struggling with since he's been able to understand the Prothean tech and language since the first game when he touched the beacon. What he sees details the final hours of the Protheans, in which they decided to send a million of their people into cryostasis in the hopes that they'd be able to rebuild after the Reapers left. In particular, we see the last moments of this tough son of a bitch named Javik. I've got so much to say about him, but we'll get to it later. For now, it's time to head back to the Citadel and complete a load of quests in addition to talking to Caden now that his boo-boos have healed a bit. We actually encounter Thane here, who sits down for a brief conversation to catch up. 
his disease has continued to take its toll. And while he can still walk and exercise, he does need daily medical attention at this stage, which explains why he can't come with us again. I do like that the devs at least included these important members from Mass Effect 2 to show what they're up to in the final game. And much like Jack, Thane's conclusion is well done. While we don't get a ton of information from him, it's clear that he's dying at a rate that both him and his doctors can't quite put an accurate assessment on. His disease doesn't hurt so much physically as it causes numbness and dizziness at times. He's at peace with what he's accomplished, and his son visits regularly. It's the end of a life. And while it is sad, it's also heartwarming in its own way to see Thane in an amicable place with how everything turned out. After chatting with Caden, which I'll detail more later, we move into how a lot of the miscellaneous stuff functions in this game. Basically, as you explore and take on missions, there will usually be a bit of intel here and a schematic there, which you can then ferry over to other people in this game. Not only does this gain you reputation, it will often net you war assets as you help others prepare for the Reapers. I like this system a lot, as a lot of this stuff contributes to the end game more than giving you extra guns to work with or the like. It makes you feel like every little thing that you can do will add another drop to the bucket that is the end score, which ultimately unlocks those different ending options. I mean, obviously not everything goes this way, as some of the stuff that you collect is just lore, but I don't mind that when much of it goes to contribute more actively to how the game plays out. Miranda is also here as she flagged Shep down earlier to tell him to meet her on the Citadel. As much as I was ready to tear into her again, she doesn't really have anything contradictory or annoying to say. She's just not a fan of the Alliance, which I can't really blame her for. So cutting ties to Cerberus without joining them has meant that she's basically been on the run this whole time. She does mention that she hasn't heard from her sister, and that she suspects that her father is involved, but that she doesn't want Shepard's help. This holds true later when she confirms her suspicions and goes off alone to rescue her sister, which is fine by me. So she's still kind of in this character stasis from before, and none of the questions that you can ask her really shed too much light on if she's changed. The Citadel itself is a lot more expanded on than it was during our first visit, and it feels really good to explore in a way that it hasn't in previous iterations. The refugee area is a desolate place packed with survivors and victims of various Reaper attacks. You can overhear conversation between refugees who are at their lowest points and those trying to inspire hope in them. Kelly Chambers is here as a psychologist to the victims, and she claims that she'd love to rejoin Shepard, but the PTSD of watching people melt around her will never let her set foot on the Normandy again. But more surprising and very welcome is Garrus, who is here helping out the Turian refugees in any way that he can. I love the idea that the rest of the crew doesn't stay put in their little rooms and wait to leave the Citadel, and instead hop off to do their own thing while you do yours. It's a very cool idea from Bioware there. Speaking of, the bar area is absolutely hilarious, and contrasts in tone so much that you'd think that you stepped into another game. But, I mean, it still kind of fits because you know people would be absolutely blasted at a time like this. You, um, can you serve us drinks? Uh, because I, I mean, I, I paid, I, I gave you money, um, you haven't, haven't poured me, I just, I just want my drink. James is down here with the other troops, and his interaction shows how much of a legend Shepard is to the common soldier when they seem to be afraid to approach him. You can offer to buy them drinks, which has a little renegade action unfolding to salute back and repeat a sort of drinking buddy phrase at them. Uh, yeah, a Paragon and Renegade actions are basically a shell of what they once were. And while I'm not going to talk about them too much, it's worth noting that most of them are kind of watered down to a point where they only vaguely embrace the Paragon and Renegade idea. The Presidium Commons area is probably my favorite place of them all though, as the sheer amount of people chatting about the events of the galaxy combined with the shopping really makes this place feel alive. You can intervene in various conversations, swaying one side or the other in an argument, warning or encouraging people to do what's right in this dire time. And it feels like you're part of a conversational ecosystem that you can directly affect in a way that was starting to be seen in Mass Effect 2, but wasn't quite fleshed out all the way until now. Jeff and Edie are here doing their thing. Liara is constantly in and out of meetings and business, and the whole place feels like a real location. I love it in a way that I hadn't anticipated, and I couldn't help but get immersed in all of the goings on here. But I think the thing that I admire the most about the Citadel is just how much effort was put into the amount of side dialogue in this game. 
In Mass Effect 2, you would often hear the exact same conversations repeatedly throughout the game. Whether you were passing by a frenzied Volus who was working the stock market, or you wanted to see if someone that you've spoken to has anything new to say, you were often met with the same string of dialogue. And that's not to say that this doesn't happen every here and there in this game, or that every single dialogue was repeated in the previous game, but new dialogue occurs from the same people quite frequently in Mass Effect 3, even if there's no inquiries to bring up with the person that you're trying to talk to. A guy gets told that his leg needs to be amputated at the hospital, and a conversation unfolds. When I come back later, he asks more about the process, and whether or not he can get it regrown or if he needs a prosthetic. Commander Bailey will remark on the amount of refugees coming out of this war after I return to him, even though there's really nothing new that I can ask him. And it's a really well done system that makes it so I don't constantly think, I'm playing a video game right now. I really appreciate how the galaxy changes and the dialogue shifts to match it. Kasumi is here, but since she was always more of a side character who we couldn't really quiz the same way that we could quiz other squad mates, she has a mission for you which involves a potentially indoctrinated Hanar instead of a long string of questions and answers. Just as a refresher, because we're going to be talking about this kind of stuff a lot, indoctrinated people are those who have been mind-controlled more or less by the Reapers and are now working for them as double agents. And Hanar are these. So yeah, she wants to tag along invisibly to help out with the issue. This has us running back and forth between these terminals to gather info, narrowing down our list of suspects until we find our guy, which happens to be the only Hanar model on this whole citadel from what I've seen. I will say that throughout this, you get a bit of conversation from Kasumi, which reveals that she wants no part in Shepard trying to rope her into another suicide mission, and that she'd rather just spend her final moments locked away with her little recollection box with her former lover's memories. Though she also says that if Jacob asked her, she'd rejoin the Normandy, so... Yeah. When the end stage of this goes down, the indoctrinated Hanar reveals that he uploaded a virus to disable the Hanar homeworld's defenses, which has Kasumi jumping out of stealth to click-clack away and stop the virus. You big stupid jellyfish. I mean, I don't think she had to break stealth to do that, but it was more dramatic this way since a specter who we were looking for had been tracking her, and he witnessed her uncloak to do this. When all is said and done, Kasumi agrees to at least help with the construction of the Prothean device, thus securing us another war asset from an old friend. The last thing we do here is drop by the lab of someone who was investigating the history of the Reapers, which leads into another string of DLC quests from the Leviathan DLC pack. It's something that I had never played, but after running through it, I can confidently say that this DLC is better suited to talk about towards the end of the video, so I'll hold off on it for now. Alright, let's go try to persuade some Krogans. So this whole thing kicks off with the best character in the franchise, Rex, negotiating with this pencil-necked Solarian leader. I'm not biased at all. Basically, Rex says that the only way that he'll send his glorious Krogan army against the Reapers in places that aren't the Krogan homeworld is if the Solarians offer up a cure to the Genophage which has been ripping through their people for a long time. The Solarian refuses and Victus insists that they cooperate. Bioware definitely made it easy to side with the Krogans here, as the indignity that the Solarian leader expresses at the idea that the Genophage should be cured is almost comical. Well, Rex isn't having it, and he brings up the instance where Morton's assistant tried to cure this manufactured ailment in the last game. Turns out the guy was actually partially successful, as a few Krogan females survived the curing process. Upon learning this, the Solarian leader sent out a task force to round up and kidnap these females, which Rex produces footage of. That's good enough for us to take his side and head to where they're being held. Let's get the females. Man, it feels good to have Rex along for the ride again. It feels even better when you include Garrus and Liara, though. We'll bring them back, Rex. Don't worry. I appreciate that, Liara. I wouldn't want anyone else along for the ride. <coughs> I suppose I can make room for you too, Garrus. <laughs> There's something to be said about the camaraderie of people who have been to hell and back together, and Bioware showcases that pretty damn well throughout this mission in little ways. When we hit the Solarian landing zone, it turns out that we're not authorized to land. Rex does not care. Thankfully, a Solarian comes scuttling out to clear up the misunderstanding, claiming that they were only just now told by their leader about the deal that we worked out. But I mean, this is supposed to be a mission with enemies. So what do you think's gonna happen? This whole planet smells wrong. Yeah, no, we don't start just blasting Solarians, that would be really stupid. So we're now waiting on the Solarians to bring the women over, and we get to catch up with Rex for a bit while that happens. 
Not too much has changed for him as his goals for his people have remained consistent since the last game. But he does hint at the idea that Liara as the new Shadow Broker probably would have had the info that he needed about the Solarians holding his cured females hostage. To which she replies that she was busy as hell. But there really isn't any revolutionary dialogue here, even if it is fun to listen to. That's what I always liked about you, Rex. My smoldering good looks? Never going to let us forget about the Rachni Wars, are you? The last time I was at the Citadel, I didn't see a Turian statue in your honor. <laughs> Anyways, let's get this over with. Guess what happens next? Sensors have picked up activity on the perimeter. Hurry, Commander. Someone will meet you below. Yeah, of course. Imagine having Jeff Bezos' space money and being able to afford thousands of soldiers and heaps of information resources, only to have every single venture that you try to stick your fingers into get broken up by literally the same person every single time. Thankfully, our boy Morden is here, who was Rex's inside source, obviously. He's changed his mind about curing the genophage after mulling it over between the second half of the last game and this game, though not entirely for ethical reasons. As such, he decided to start working on trying to use his former assistant's notes to perfect a cure, which has led to two out of three of the Krogan females dying in the process. Cerberus wants the last one, presumably so they can try to drum up another Krogan army for themselves. Of course, no protagonist in this game can make any sort of assumption about the enemy until they throw their hands in the air and tilt their head back in maniacal laughter while telling the protagonist exactly why they're doing something. So Shepard has no clue why Cerberus would want the female. But yeah, we help the Krogan, who Morden named Eve, to escape. And the aftermath has Rex insisting that Morden create that cure, or he won't help the Turians. This leads into some petty squabbling between the two leaders, which results in each of them having another mission for me to do with their respective sides. Additionally, work has now begun on the Prothean device, which has been dubbed the Crucible, which will have more and more added to it as the game progresses. Now the cool bit is that both Rex and Morden are going to stick around on the Normandy for a bit while all of this is going down, which is a fun way to go about things. I like that the companion ecosystem in this game kind of cycles between past and present squad members, and that your interactions might be something as quick and simple as, hey, I have a mission for you, or something more nuanced like these two have. It's a smooth and elegant way of making the story flow together. And at this stage, I really can't see myself winding up disliking this game like I did before, but we'll see about that. I know a lot of this falls off at the end of the game. Rex's mission involves one of his units heading out to Rachni Space to check out some commotion there before their comms went dark. As a brief reminder, the Rachni were those bug-like creatures who have the capability of assuming control of a host in order to speak to others. We let their queen go to populate and hopefully aid us eventually way back in the first game. The other races viewed them unfavorably as they were once invaders who tried to conquer the galaxy. The Krogans were the ones who put them down then, so you can understand the concern here with these new developments. Rex himself has become a really strong leader, one who understands that war has only led his people to misery. He claims that he knows that his people will want to immediately attack the Turians and Salarians after they get back on their feet, but that he's not going to let them. It's really cool to see this guy who used to turn his back on his own people for being the bloodthirsty warmongers that they were now leading his people to something better. For males, uh... Good show of force sorts things out. But females like to talk about it. Then think about it. <sighs> then talk about it some more. Women have good ideas, Rex. You should listen. Yeah, but they have so many of them. So sometimes I pretend to listen and... Well, let's just say Krogan females have tempers too. I'm really sorry for playing every line of Rex dialogue, but I can't help myself. The guy just makes me laugh in a way that no one else really does in these games. I like what you've done with the Normandy. Got tired of always hanging around the cargo bay before. I still don't have a window like Liara does, but maybe that's because I don't kiss as well. <laughs> Alright, I'll stop. For now. Victus's mission involves a platoon of his men who were sent on a top secret mission to Rex's homeworld of Tachanka before they were shot down. He wants me to bail them out of there, but won't tell me why they were there in the first place, which isn't very reassuring. We'll round them up when it's time to put a nail in the coffin of the first act. There is one more set of people to talk to on the ship before we fuck off, namely Morden and Eve. Eve is an absolute badass, as you might expect of a female Krogan who's been through what she has. She's extraordinarily wise, and understands that her people need to become more peaceful and willing to work with others to survive. 
She details the excruciating experience that an infertile Krogan has to go through, explaining the hopelessness that she and her sisters felt when they had their first stillborn babies. Many Krogan females would simply wander into the wasteland and hope to get eaten by a Thresher Maul rather than continue to bear that pain. And she thought about doing that as well before finding the strength to try to make a change instead. There's a reason why the Krogan race is my favorite in these games. And it isn't just because a lot of the males are these overly aggressive alphas who try to fight everything. It's also because of what their people have come from and what has made them this way. They're this incredibly resilient race of tough as nails but still intelligent in many ways badasses. And the trials which their clans have undergone with the Genophage has molded them into much wiser people. Of course, that's not true of every Krogan. I'd argue that most of them are still kind of meatheads. But their smartest and best have always taken these lessons and done what they can to survive with the hope of eventually thriving again. Morden, on the other hand, uh, I actually wish we could get more out of him. It's weird, I liked his character progression a lot. But I suppose he was always a nerdy scientist at heart. As such, he's more immersed in his work than he is with catching up with Shepard. And nearly all of our questions pertain to the genophage cure itself. He does explain that he's now arrived at the conclusion that while the genophage was necessary at the time, it's still important to cure it now with the Reaper threat in full effect. He does own up to his mistakes and knows that he is imperfect, but he's also getting older and understands his place in the universe explicitly. Might go somewhere sunny, sit on beach, look at ocean, collect seashells. You'd go crazy inside an hour. Might run tests on the seashells. All right, let's go take care of Rex's rachni problem first. Backing you up is Rex's most elite unit, led by the big boy himself, Grunt. He's elated to see you and briefly explains how he came to lead this top-notch unit before we take off to try to figure out where this missing squad went to. Well, it turns out that the Reapers have gotten their greedy tendrils around the Rachni, corrupting the bugs to fight for them. You get a flamethrower for this mission, as is the mandatory equipment with any buggy levels in a video game because fuck it, we've done every other action trope. That said, my Nova attack is just... Uh, it's the best thing that you can do in this game in 95% of the situations. Regardless, we make it through to the Queen, who's been locked down by Reaper Tech. And here comes our big option. Either we free her again, this time to fight against the Reapers, or we save Grunt's unit from death. The first time I played this game, I went with Grunt's unit. I mean, they seemed like pretty swell fellas. But realistically, I saved the Queen in the first game, so why not save her again? So I go for that this time, and it leads to Grunt running back to help out. And then we get this scene. My turn. <laughs> Now, I wasn't sure what the parameters for this outcome were, because it's happened in the path where I spared his unit as well. And I figured that since I sided with the Queen, that Grunt would actually die this time, but... Grunt! Anybody got something to eat? Uh. Yeah, he's fine. I love this scene. Even more so this time, since I was ready to reload after the thought crossed my mind that he was dead for sure after this choice but his survival actually depends on if he was loyal to you or not in the previous game, which is a cool consequence that carries over. Honestly, this is one of the bigger missions for previous game choices, as even choosing what you did with the Queen in the first game makes an impact. Basically, if you killed it in Mass Effect 1, it still exists here, claiming to be the real last Rachni Queen. But what it actually is, is a fully indoctrinated construction by the Reapers. And if you choose to save this copy, it will eventually betray your forces while taking a chunk out of your war asset score. I love that possibility, especially since I didn't know that it existed until now. Overall, it's an okay mission combat-wise, but a really cool one outcome-wise. Afterwards, Morden strides in to tell you that his work on the genophage cure is complete, and that he's ready to spread it around. To do this, we're going to commandeer the same ventilation tower called the Shroud that was used to spread the genophage in the first place as a kind of full circle moment. Before that, I'd do a couple of random side quests which continue to make me question Cerberus's competence, as they always result in a victory and more resources for the Alliance. 
At this stage, those who have played the game before know what's up, but I guess I wanted to paint the picture here for now as far as how Cerberus seems to be faring. I'll try to ease off and we'll circle back to this thought when the time arrives. Commander, Chief Engineer Adams would like to speak with you down in engineering. You should go see Adams, Commander. Adams would like to speak to you. Hello, Commander. Hello, Commander. Alright, time to go rescue some Turians and cure a genophage. The Turian rescue goes about as you would expect. The cool twist to this mission though is that if you don't drive off the various harvesters fast enough, they'll wind up killing the survivors here. I don't think it impacts much besides some dialogue and extra XP, but it is a fun addition to an otherwise normal quest. When you make it to the end, Victus' son is trying to wrestle back control of his men, who are blaming him for this mission going awry. The son tells you that they were sent here to defuse a gigantic Cerberus bomb, which wound up with them running into Reaper forces. When the son decided to try to take a sneakier route around, they got pinned down with nowhere to maneuver and his men blamed him for it. Either way, we get the son to reinforce his troops' morale and then offer to tag along on the bomb defusal. What these guys don't tell you at first is that the bomb was originally a Turian bomb that was planted hundreds of years ago after the war with the Krogans. Well, they don't tell you that for like a whole mission, and then they tell you it immediately at the start of the bomb mission. I guess they wanted to make sure that you would help first. After chewing through Cerberus' forces, we wind up defusing the bomb at the cost of Victus' son's life, which seemed more like a plot device than anything that actually made logical sense. Actually, this whole mission has some kind of weird logic to it. I mean, this bomb was rigged up to drop its payload by disengaging some locks and then dropping the cradle containing the bomb down a shaft into the earth, right? I'm not an engineer, so that's my vague assessment of it. It was buried in the ground and then Cerberus dug it up. Then Cerberus made it so that if anyone tried to hack into the computer system to shut down the triggering mechanism, it would automatically go off on a one minute timer, which is what happened. So Victus's son had to run up and manually get the cradle to fall away from the bomb so that the bomb doesn't drop with the cradle. Again, I'm not an expert, but this whole system seems really wonky and kind of a, just believe us bro, this is how it would work kind of thing. But more importantly, this should continue to stick out in your mind as another instance of how shittily Cerberus is performing. For all intents and purposes, they dug up a bomb before anyone noticed, and then they went into the computer system and set it to explode on a timer if anyone tampered with it, instead of just setting it off. Again, we'll circle back to this thought process later, but it's something to keep in mind for now. When we make it back, Rex is obviously mad at Victus for not telling his people that the Turians left a bomb on the planet forever ago. In his eyes, if the relationship had healed to a point where they could trust each other, then they should have let them know what the Turians' ancestors did, which kind of makes sense. Victus apologizes, Rex won't have it, Shepard steps in, and peace prevails. Or something like that. Let's go cure that phage. So this is the big end to Act 1 out of 3 acts total. As such, there's a big choice. Well, a couple of big choices. The first one is to backstab the Krogans by siding with the Salarian leader. Basically, the Salarians sabotage the Shroud so that it would alter any potential cure to be ineffective. Of course, Morden, being the brilliant scientist that he is, would have detected this sabotage and fixed it. So the Salarian leader turns to Shepard in an attempt to bargain with him. If he stays silent and deals with Morden however he needs to, Shepard is promised the full brunt of the Salarian combat force, including their top engineers to work on the Crucible. Now it may come as a surprise, but I have a very slight fondness for the Krogan species. I know that's shocking because I haven't really shown it in any way, but that lukewarm fondness is going to keep me from betraying them here, and instead has me telling the Krogans what the Salarians tried to pull. Still, this is a really cool way to create some replayability especially when Rex finds out about the sabotage later in the game and winds up dying because of it. When we make it further towards the Shroud, it turns out that the road is collapsed, wouldn't you know it. It takes a Turian pilot spinning out of control and smashing into the convoy for them to go, oh shit, let's use the road anyways, and then it collapses the rest of the way after the two most important trucks make it over. This is something that I'll talk more about later, but uh, a lot of Mass Effect 3's big plot points pivot exclusively around a very specific circumstance that isn't always the best excuse. In this case, the writers could have just made it so that the Reaper noticed the convoy first, and then had it start shooting artillery strikes towards them before they could get any closer, rather than the road being crumbled, but not too crumbled, but still crumbled. Regardless, we press through some ancient Krogan ruins, which are actually pretty cool to look at. Of course, there are Reaper forces throughout them, but that's to be expected. 
The issue where I just wholesale annihilate enemies at a rapid rate unfortunately causes a lot of the dialogue here to be skipped or to overlap with other dialogue. Which sucks because a lot of what's said is actually pretty fun to listen to. Speaking of, the mother of all Thresher Maws has made its home here in these runes, which is what we're gonna try to use to get the Reaper out of the way. This has us running over to ring these two big ass gongs, which will lure the Thresher Maw over to the Reaper, because apparently it only responds to big ass hammers hitting the earth and not the fucking colossal Reaper smacking the ground in an attempt to crush us. So yeah, more scripted laser dodging, arm dodging, and a barrage of brutes, which seem to be the only big unit that these guys have at this stage. When we finally bring the two hammers down, the Thresher Maw realizes that there is in fact a building-sized creature over near the Shroud, and it winds up taking the Reaper down. I mean, it is a cool scene, even if the logistics are... flawed. And this leads us to the second big decision of the act, even if we already made it. If you haven't warned the Krogans about the Solarian plot, you can choose to kill Morden and stop the cure from being released. If Rex and Eve were both dead in your playthrough due to your decision making, which is a whole other potential angle to this mission, you can also convince Morden to not disperse the cure. Regardless, my prior decisions have led to this one outcome, in which Morden ascends the Shroud alone, which has been critically damaged in the fight. His last act before he dies is pushing out the cure while humming to himself. It's a very heartfelt scene, though I always wish that he kind of bolted for the elevator at least before perishing. But I can forgive that since he viewed this whole thing as something that he needed to do before he died. The resulting scene is a beautifully bittersweet moment as the victory was won at a steep cost. I mean, at least it was steep to me. I love Morden. We'll name one of the kids after him. Maybe a girl. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Rex. After pledging the Krogan forces to the cause and thanking Shepard, the two Krogan part ways with him before he heads back to secure the Turian fleet's support as well. Thank you for all that you've done, and know that Erdnot Bakara calls you a friend. Bakara? Isn't that a Mortal Kombat character? Act 2 begins with Shep getting a call from the Salarian Counselor to denounce him as a big dumb idiot for the heinous act of allowing the Krogans to breed again. God, the Salarians piss me off. Sure, raise up the Krogans specifically for their military might and then just put them down because they're too mean afterwards. Fucking morons. Anyways, the real reason that the Counselor calls us is to state that she suspects that Udina is laundering dirty money. I imagine to make sure that they can build the Crucible and to help Earth, but still, apparently it's a pretty big concept that has a huge priority when the galaxy is under attack. I know this is kind of a weird place to insert this gripe, but it's become more apparent as time has gone on. The journal system in this game sucks. It's really bad. And with as many missions that have planets for you to scan, items for you to acquire, and people for you to report in on, there are no steps which are displayed showing your progress. So if a Volus wants a particular artifact and I can't remember if I picked it up yet, it usually has me flying back to the part of the galaxy where the artifact is supposed to be housed before remembering whether or not I grabbed it. It seems like such a basic thing to include a progress bar or text in your quests, but this game doesn't include anything like that, not even in the remastered version. So after another exciting phase of Cerberus fighting and planet scanning, I hightail it back to the Citadel to stop the worst crime of all, money laundering. Well, okay, the laundering might have more of a serious implication if Cerberus is the one that Udina is getting money from. Chances seem to be pretty high when it turns out that Cerberus has just decided to attack the Citadel now because fuck it. The picture that's painted here is that Cerberus attacked right as the lead investigator was about to be set loose on Udina, and so Udina must have called Cerberus. You can choose to have Shepard kind of deny it now to give Udina the benefit of the doubt, but eventually he just goes, Get the word out. Udina's trying to seize power. Hey, remember that one time when I chose Anderson for the role of counselor and then the writers were like, nah, this is better. Whatever. So eventually we encounter literal Jetstream Sam from Metal Gear Rising. I guess this game came first, but, you know, just humor me here. And he's about to assassinate the Solarian Counselor with his finely crafted black steel katana straight from the Citadel's Experience Japan gift shop. We roll up on him and we're like, all right, buddy, it's three on one, time to give up. And he hits us with this anime line. No, no, it's fun. 
Then he gets his ass smeared by Thane, who's just fucking dying at this stage in the game. Like, the dude can't even leave the hospital, and he basically single-handedly beats on this weeb for a bit. Then he gets fucking stabbed. I love the idea that Shepard and his crew are just watching this like an action movie and only act after Thane's been critically injured. Thane, are you okay? Am I... what? I just got stabbed, Shepard. Where the fuck were you doing that? I, uh, I thought you had it. There were three of you with guns. I thought I was the distraction. Look, Thane, he had a sword. Shooting him wouldn't have been very fair. Shepard, I'm dying from space polio. Anyways, this leads into a car chase where Raiden jumps on the roof of the vehicle and puts his sword through the part of the car that makes it function correctly. We crash land and he gets away. This feels like an entirely different game at this stage in terms of tone thanks to this single set of cutscenes. And it only gets worse when we climb on top of an elevator to catch the assassin who's on a different elevator. Commander Bailey has assumed direct control of the elevator system and is causing the elevator with Grey Fox to stop at every floor. We shoot out the power on that one, the ninja somehow overrides Bailey's override, and then begins ascending again in another elevator, I'd imagine. This is not how elevators work, but we're all on this ride together. Eventually, we make it to the elevator with Udina, Caden, and two other counselors. Udina yells out, Shepherds with Cerberus, because fuck it, who cares about plot at this stage? Wow, I honest to God went from, this game is really fun and well written so far, to questioning if this is an outtake that somehow made it into the game. Caden has a conniption trying to figure out if Shepard was really a Cerberus agent this whole time before Udina just tries to start opening the door. The Asari counselor attempts to stop him and he gingerly suplexes her into the ground and pulls out a gun to execute her. Shepard gets a renegade option here, which I take. And instead of shooting the gun out of Udina's hand or shooting Udina in the arm, the leg, the dick, whatever, he shoots him in the heart. We still have zero evidence beyond the Solarian Counselor telling us that Udina did this. That's the same Counselor that wanted me to lie to the Krogans and kill Morden, by the way. Bailey comes through the door, claims that Cerberus is leaving now, and then the Turian Counselor finally fillets Shepard the way that he deserves after saving his ass again in addition to his home planet. And then... then that's it. Holy shit. Yeah, Cerberus leaves, a scene plays out where the elusive man tells Strider that he's a big fuck-up and that Udina was expendable. Then it's revealed that Thane was hospitalized and that there may not be enough Drell blood to keep him alive. And now we're just back on the Citadel to do shit on it again. Except now it's laggier than before, which is weird. I guess it's just trying to load all of this damage. But yeah, this is where we say goodbye to Thane. As much as the game just vomited on the floor and then proceeded to force you to watch it eat its own puke, it does still do these touching moments really well. I will say that both Morden and Thane were near the ends of their lives, and their sacrifices were heroic, which makes their deaths a lot more palatable. Still, it is sad, but ultimately a good scene to send him out on. Goodbye, Thane. You won't be alone long. So now we enter a much sadder and more despair-filled version of the Citadel. The tone has shifted from people worrying but still trying to go about their lives to giving into loss after the Citadel was attacked. Mechanically, it's about the same as before, with new optional side things to pick up for people across the galaxy. All of them go nearly exactly the same way, where one person is talking to another and they go, Man, if only we could have gotten the obelisk of Fortnite Exodia. That would certainly help the war effort. And then you just go off and grab it and bring it back to them. It's, it's the same thing every time but the overall atmosphere does feel a lot more gloomy. I just wish that the scene that led into this didn't feel like it came straight out of Ninja Gaiden. Oh, also, Kelly Chambers was shot between the eyes by Cerberus off-screen. You wanna know how? A group of armed men in full Cerberus uniform marched up to her and said, Hey, are you Kelly Chambers? And she said, Yup. Not a wrinkle in that brain, apparently. I guess there's less now. It's also worth noting that everyone has scrambled around a bit from their previous positions. James is playing cards with the refugees. James is playing card. He actually is playing cards with the refugees. He's just like, hey man, I know you're having a rough time and your home's been destroyed. You probably don't have a lot of money, but uh, you know what? Let's play some fucking poker, dude. I'm about to win your money. I'm about to win the remaining money from you. Edie and Joker have gotten closer on the dance floor, kind of. Liara moved from one side of the commons to the other and so on. Jack is also at the bar, and you can dance with her after she gives you a little more insight into her life as a teacher and a role model now, which is nice. 
Heading back to the Normandy finally has us picking up Caden again, and learning about the Asari and Salarians throwing in more support now that we saved their counselors again. The Quarians are also willing to help, but seem to be having troubles with the Geth, which is our big conflict of Act Two. And finally, Liara approaches us to tell us that the Asari High Command has been having issues of their own, which we can intervene in to win more support. Oh, and Anderson tells you that the Reapers have now decided to amass and attack London in full force, which goes to show you that even machine life views London as a blight. Brief side note, this was right around the time when the writers went, oh yeah, romance hasn't happened yet, and you're hit with a couple of different potential romantic scenes. Jack was actually one of them if you had chosen her in the previous game. That said though, so far the dialogue has seen a bit of upgrading. A big complaint that I had before was that Shepard was a bit menacing when it came to pressuring females for sex or just general romance, with the biggest one being the way that Samara was handled. While in this game, our options as male Shep are all of the previous game's female interests, Kelly Chambers before she wound up as a stain on the Citadel, Caden, Cortez down in the vehicle bay, and the reporter Diana Allers. Samantha Trainer is a possibility for Fem Shep, which can turn a little awkward when male Shep invites her up for a game of chess. But, that said, he doesn't do the whole, ah, oh, come on, just try it, sort of shtick that he tried with Samara. Instead, he politely apologizes for misreading a signal a couple of times before the two play more chess, and that's it. I don't know what changed between games, but I'm all for it. All right, so let's tackle the Asari issue first. The long and short of it was that a distress call was sent out from the Ardot Yakshi base out in one of the corners of the galaxy. I explained this a lot more in my Mass Effect 2 video, but the Ardot Yakshi are the Asari that were born with a very rare genetic trait that makes it so that they overload their partner's brains and kill them when they fuck, more or less. The facility that sent out the distress call is the safe haven for those that pledge to isolate themselves in order to not kill. Two of Samara's remaining daughters are housed there, and as such, so is Samara. The threat here is always a coin flip between Cerberus and the Reapers, with the Reapers winning out this time around. Asari commandos have been dispatched to blow the place up with bombs, but have seemingly perished against the Reaper threat. The big addition to the Reaper forces this time around stem from transforming Asari into wraiths, which are cool-ass enemies. I do like how the Reapers occasionally add to their forces by indoctrinating and repurposing their victims into new threats, as they did with the Rachni. But yeah, this place is pretty much done for, as the only remaining survivors conveniently seem to be Samara's children, one of which is undergoing the process of becoming a wraith. All right, we got an okay setup, right? Unfortunately, this is where the game trips and falls flat on its face, again. So Samara's daughter starts to transform, and she goes to attack the other daughter. This is cured temporarily like this. <laughs> But it doesn't matter because she's still transforming, I guess. So there's a heartfelt goodbye between the two before the transforming daughter pulls out the best recurring guest in the series, the Detonator. Now the whole time leading up to this moment had Shepard debating whether or not to blow up the facility like that was going to be the big option here. That option is now out the window even though I've been picking the dialogue that has him stating that we wouldn't blow the place up if we could avoid it. So Shepard pulls away Daughter 2 as she tries to escape back to Daughter 1, and we take off up the elevator. Then Daughter 1 blows herself up. The entire time it sounded like the point of the bombs was to destroy the facility. What it did was destroy the one room that we were just in. Okay. Then, since there has to be a big dramatic moment, Samara with her dumbass code goes, well, normally I'd have to kill you because all our dot Yakshi have to live in this facility and we just blew it up. Fucking what? We're still standing on the facility, first of all. Second of all, this is like the most extenuating set of circumstances ever. So instead of pledging to kill her last daughter, Samara tries to kill herself. You can stop this with a Paragon action. So let me get this straight. You set up a scenario where the Asari Commandos and the Ardot Yakshi should be working together to fight the Reapers. You could have had it so that the Reapers were repelled, and the Commandos decide that it's time to eliminate the Ardot Yakshi once and for all. And then you might have had to choose which side to play for, or maybe had to broker a deal between the two. Samara would have had a mental breaking point at the idea of choosing her daughters or her code. But instead, what we get is, wow, everyone's dead at this place except a character that we grew close to in the last game and her two daughters. I don't understand this writing decision. And the only thing that makes sense to me is that the writers decided they just didn't want to spend more time trying to flesh out this alternate route that makes sense to me. 
But whatever, I guess this is what we got. At least you have a couple of different outcomes here in the form of Samara's attempted suicide, and then the fact that we can then choose to kill her daughter or not afterwards. Regardless, the outcome that we get has Samara deciding to join the fight, and her daughter staying here to eat Doritos out of the vending machines while pretending to rebuild. Way earlier on, we got access to meet up with the Asari who basically ruled all of the gangs at Omega in the previous game, but I never actually went to meet her. It's a DLC quest, and I've been very impressed with all of the DLC that this game has had to offer so far. So let's head back to the Citadel for now. Apparently, nearly every crew member has sent me an email saying, hey, we're fucking exhausted, let's kick back on the Citadel. So I can also go meet up with all of them while I'm here. And then I fell into the trap. So Anderson decided to gift Shepard his personal apartment, which is a fucking marvel of construction. And I decided to visit that when I got back to the Citadel. You can decorate it, which I've always been a sucker for. And I thought, wow, this is really cool. What I didn't realize was that this led into an absolute monster of a DLC. So yeah, I came here for one DLC and got another. The apartment itself has a good 20 to 25 minutes of dialogue from Anderson describing his life and experiences to someone who's going to be penning his biography. A lot of it pads the idea of what the Alliance and Seven, Shepard, and so on are collectively to humanity. It does a really good job of conveying the hope that humans have in these forces, and how heroic their actions really have been throughout these games. It's a very cool way to scrounge up some extra lore for those who care to delve deeper into this franchise. For now though, investigating the apartment leads into the first mission of many, in which Shepard takes up Joker on his offer to meet him for sushi. After sitting down, Joker soon thanks Shepard for inviting him to dinner, and visible confusion ensues as Shep was under the assumption that Joker was the one that invited him. This inept joke of an Alliance intelligence officer runs up and tells Shepard that a third party that isn't Cerberus or the Reapers is now after him. And then the writers let us know that they loved The Dark Knight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's performance is brought to you by Random Acts of Violence. This turns into a stealth sequence, which uh, I didn't realize until I was done killing nearly everyone here. Whoops. So this entire spectacle is Bioware's take on a comedy-infused escape through a bustling futuristic city. All of the stores which we pass through seem to have journal entries which are more humorous in tone. And while they didn't really tickle me, I guess I don't really mind, because Rex shows up and I'm always happy about that. The whole thing turns into a wave defense on a timer, and then a quick evacuation back to the apartment, where the rest of the squad shows up to get to the bottom of who's hunting Shepard. Now it is worth noting here that this whole string of missions seem like they're much better suited to do just before initiating the point of no return, and I think that would have been the optimal way to play them. That said, I had no idea what scoping out Anderson's apartment would initiate, so I guess I would have liked it if the devs decided to constrain being able to participate in this event until the third act at least. Oh well. Liara winds up tracing one of the guns used by the mystery mercs back to a rich guy who deals firearms illegally on the Citadel. He also apparently runs a casino, which turns our thrilling Jason Bourne movie into a casino heist movie. I look ridiculous. So the whole thing plays out like a better version of Kasumi's loyalty mission from the last game. Basically, the intelligence officer from before is joining us by crawling through the ventilation to get us into where we can meet the rich guy. He's locked himself away after the people who he sold the guns to failed to kill Shepard. Rex and Shep's job is to mingle and act natural, while helping out with any issues that come up during the infiltration. We deactivate alarms, distract guards, and play an embarrassing amount of horse racing in Pazak 2.0. It's actually pretty damn fun in its own right, and I'm surprisingly glad that they revisited this infiltration idea. When we make it to the rich guy, he's already dead, and the data tracing back to whoever did this is being wiped we get a brief scrambled glimpse of the mystery man who's trying to kill Shep before he hangs up, and the intelligence officer claims that she couldn't trace the call back in time. If I were a betting man, I'd say that this officer is in on the Shepard killing quest just because she's been constantly willing to help, and that's not predictable at all. When next we pin down our Shepard killers, it's decided that the entire crew should be part of this mission. At this stage, it's clear that these writers have never tried harder to make their dialogue comedic. I mean, it's literally punchline after punchline with various degrees of success. It's a really weird shift because normally these comedic moments in these games are done really well since they only pop up occasionally and at unexpected times. 
But this is just... Well, you know, the bigger the target, the bigger the, uh... Tar target. You trying to say I've gained weight? Trying? I thought I kind of succeeded in a right over the Krogan's head sort of way. It's all just part of the job. Wait. Job? You mean the rest of you are getting paid for this? It appears this drone is preparing to rebel. Then we'll find our own way in. Gear up and let's... What's with the Volas? Oh, pizza delivery guy. I got the munchies. And at this stage, I kind of like deleted part of my script just because I realized that I was being way too overly critical of this DLC solely because of the issues that I began to have during the actual game's writing. This is definitely the devs making fun of all of these different tropes, movies, cliches, etc. And this is only further exacerbated by a clone of Shepard coming out to tell you that he was made by Cerberus also when Shepard was revived. It's not exactly my favorite type of comedy, as it kind of takes the series that I enjoy for its subtle humor and cranks those subtleties to 11. But yeah, we're now chasing Shep's clone through these archives. The archives themselves have some pretty cool historical events which play out. Like the fact that the Salarian government didn't consent to the genophage being dispersed, which was instead pushed out solely by the Turians. But this is overall a pretty standard mission, except with the squad all making jokes constantly. When we finally do catch up to the clone ship, yeah, the intelligence officer betrays us. Now, I will say that for as many jokes that seemed like they were trying a bit too hard, this ending absolutely killed me. First, we've got this dialogue option. The minute, the second I get out of here, I'm gonna take your head and mount it in the Normandy CIC. Then I'm gonna mount his head next to yours. Then I'm gonna take both of your heads and space them out the airlock. Secondly, we get locked away in this vault here. He said, I should go. Do I sound like that? As long as I've known you, yeah. I'm more confident than he is, more in control. With me, it's more like, that's all for now. Or sometimes, I'll talk to you later. Because you know what? I never do. Leave him wanting more. Commander, why aren't you more concerned about this? Hmm? Oh, Glyph, you still out there? Yes, Commander. Unlock this damn thing and go find the others. No one steals my shit. Not even me. All right, you, you finally got me. This shit is hilarious. I think I had a hard time transitioning from a more serious game with heartfelt writing to this, and I really wish that I had picked up Tally for it. So the whole thing winds up with us chasing down Clone Shep, using a toothbrush to break into the Normandy, and then busting into a firefight aboard the ship. Armory. Find him. Slow him down. Hey, bring me my slow down. We're about to kill Shepard if we have to, right? He said slow him down because he thinks we're cannon fodder. Oh. Well. Shit. Eventually, we get to the part where both Shepards tumble down the open Normandy vehicle bay door, and Garrus and Rex pull up the real Shep. Then you can choose to try to save the clone or kill him. But it doesn't matter because the clone will let go anyways if you try to save it. So, um... But it's not over yet, as there's one more thing to do now that the shore leave is winding down. Party our asses off. Now thankfully you can actually return to the Normandy before starting up the festivities, which means that I can wait until Tally is here to initiate it before the point of no return. Overall, this DLC is hard to evaluate the way that I normally do because a lot of the humor is completely subjective. I initially wanted to start tearing into things that didn't make sense, but the game doesn't take anything seriously at this stage, even poking fun at its past entries at times. So, anyone want to talk about their people's history? Nope. So I'm the only one who misses when we used to chat in the elevators back on the Citadel? Yep. So disappointing. But I have to give credit to these guys. They wanted to do something different to remember the series by. And what they did was pretty damn cool in its own right. They shook up the mechanics with stealth. They revamped the Kasumi infiltration idea. They had the whole crew go in on one mission. And they even did get a few good laughs out of me. I think one of my favorite parts, though, is the fact that you can actually go and visit the strip where all of these eye-catching neon colors and shapes fight for your attention in this futuristic sci-fi urban environment. I'm gonna hold off on delving into the rest of this until the end, but I gotta say that I'm still very impressed overall with the DLC of this game. 
So let's see if those good vibes continue and actually go do the DLC that I came here to do. Arya's here already, causing trouble after being booted off Omega by the elusive man. She is not happy about that. But she also has the insight to realize that the Reapers are… a threat? So in a two birds with one stone maneuver, she suggests that you bring together the three gangs who made up the majority of the previous game's enemies under her rule, and then she'll lend them to you for the war. This leads into easily the worst set of missions in the whole game, all of which have you kowtowing to the various gang leaders to ensure that they're put in charge or kept satisfied. Meaning that if you're playing nice guy, Shepard, you're going to be running back and forth around the Citadel to talk to various people to work out deals. There's little intrigue, and the whole thing amounts to a form of fetch questing that I have a strong disdain for. The Blue Suns in particular have you talking to a dude who's at the docks, then talking to a Turian general to get him to ease off of the Suns, then talking to a Black Markets dealer to try to broker a weapons trade between him and the general, and then promising to scan some planets for weapons for the arms dealer. Or you can just say fuck it and have the Turian general killed, which is what I went for after realizing that I have no clue where to scan for the weapons and even less of a care to. Now thankfully there is another mission related to Arya which is a bit more interesting that you can partake in after rounding up the mercs. This one has you heading to Omega in a squad with just you and Arya, and then kicking Cerberus off of Omega. What ensues is a pretty flashy set of cutscenes complete with all of the good explosions and dramatic escape sequence stuff that you could hope for as the guy who Arya lost Omega to pops over the comms to state bluntly that he's upgraded the defenses of the station. Then it's business as usual after the ship that we're on gets torn to shreds and we make it inside Omega on an escape shuttle. I gotta say, for as ruthless and cunning that Arya has been portrayed as before all of this, she makes some pretty stupid decisions at times. I've made improvements to Omega's outer defenses. My cannons will cut through you at will. We're ramming the station. Everyone brace for impact. What? It's a bunker I established on D-Deck for my more sensitive operations. It's utterly impenetrable with its own secret hangar and dock. Independent power source, life support, munitions. You'll see. I was honestly hoping that her stating aloud that we were heading to a secret dock with the supplies that we need to take Omega back was a ruse to get this guy to send his men down there and get caught with his pants down when we show up elsewhere. But no, she just felt like speaking loudly about the next step down to the very detail. The remainder of the mission introduces some barriers which fry people at the touch, some robots which… die easily, and the first and possibly only female Turian that I can recall seeing and talking to throughout this series, one that used to be Arya's lover. While it isn't the most amazing mission ever, I did enjoy these factors that were inserted for this DLC. After securing a small bunker, there's a bit of downtime between missions which surprisingly leads to Shepard being able to talk with Arya's men and seeing what they need him to grab in a form of optional side questing. The whole thing is a lot bigger than I initially gave it credit for, as you're now trying to recruit another merc group who has remained on Omega to resist Cerberus this whole time. Again, it isn't the most amazing string of missions ever, but you can tell that a lot of effort went into this DLC for as shitty of an introduction that it had. You know, if DLC was always like this nowadays, I'd never have an issue buying it. When we get back into the fray, it's revealed that Arya's former lover, Nyreen, is actually the leader of the gang called the Talons, and is trying to steer them in a new direction. The Talons have been evacuating civilians while protecting them, and have generally been a force of good among all of the corruption that Omega typically exudes. It's a good counterpoint to Arya, and I can already see where the writers are going with this here. That said, the actual level design is… lacking. There are a lot of elevator sequences which are obviously load zones, but usually those are filled with some kind of small conversation to keep your mind off of it. This time, however, every load zone besides maybe one or two were dead silent, despite the fact that these former lovers haven't seen each other in years. Though I guess they also had a falling out since Nyreen was pretty justice focused and Arya was… the opposite. Still, it feels like this whole thing was a room full of fighting followed by an elevator ride repeatedly. Eventually, we make it to the Talon's base of operation. This is where Arya steps in to seize control, being the megalomaniac that she is. I was hoping the people around her would boo her and throw shit at her, but nah, she just gains their support through a little speech. After staving off another wave of Cerberus soldiers, Nyreen commits her Talon forces to our cause, while basically stating that she knows that Arya is manipulating her and the people of Omega. I like how this is the first female Turian that you ever see in the entire series, and it's just a male Turian with crazy big female eyelashes. 
Anyways, our next mission involves restoring power to the parts of Omega that have been powered down in order to erect those fiery-ass barriers from before. This means that we have to head to the mining area and restore the power to it first to make it further in. This is where the adjutants come into play. So the adjutants are supposedly these horrific monsters which have been experimented on by Cerberus. They're said to be able to rip whole squads to shreds, that their ferocity is absolutely unparalleled. This is made clear when there are heaps of Cerberus bodies lying around in the mining area. I've gotta say, this is probably the third or fourth time in this game where we've had this really dark, dramatic area with lighting akin to a horror game. But there must have been some kind of general decision made about fighting in the dark when designing this game because there's literally never combat in these dark spaces. It's crazy because they really set it up to be this super scary and tense situation and then nothing happens until you turn the lights on. This time, as soon as we hit the generator, an adjutant comes busting through the window. And this absolutely goofy motherfucker is not what I expected at all. Dude looks like the Sultan from Aladdin. So we take out a few more of them before they break out into a musical number, head further in, take out more soldiers, and eventually make it to the generator. The guy who took over the station then traps us in with more lava walls and Arya just... She just reaches in and starts pulling the thing open. Alright, cool. I, I didn't even think that was a possibility here. I would have suggested standing on each other's shoulders and tossing Shepard over. Instead, we fight off more robots before Nyrene helps Arya to gape open the barrier like a Tinder date, and Shepard rolls through. After this, you can have Shepard immediately hit the big red renegade button in order to reroute the power at the cost of a lot of civilians' lives since their power would be cut off in exchange. Or you can wait it out and play Minesweeper for a few minutes while Nyrene and Arya nearly die. I chose the latter, saving everyone involved in this clash. The force fields go down everywhere, and riots break out all over Omega. The enemy leader then orders his troops to blow up the central column to prevent us from ascending any further into Omega, which is what we have to try to stop from happening next. I do have to say that this is where the devs sprinkle a little bit of doubt about sticking to Arya's side. Well, not a bit. It's, uh, it's pretty damn aggressive. But they did it well. Because you start as her lackey, someone who's doing her bidding. But Nyrene is everything that's counter to her. And she's not willing to use people the way that Arya is. So while you do start off by thinking that this is generally going to be a renegade-centric set of quests, it turns into you getting that choice to slowly push against Arya as time goes on. I like that. So we run interference on the bombing and continue to work our way up through fight after fight, while learning about the way that Cerberus experimented on adjutants in order to control them and use them for an army. Eventually, the remaining adjutants get loose and Nyrene blows them up along with herself, which actually isn't the route that I thought this would go. I would have thought that this would have come down to a power struggle between Nyrene and Arya, which would have been more interesting if it was done right. With the way that things went down, this felt a little overly dramatic, but I guess not too bad per se. Arya spins into a rage and charges headfirst into a trap, and the final battle has us activating four different pillars, destroying the parts of the barrier that they correlate to, and freeing Arya before mopping up the remaining forces here. Now this is the cool part. Depending on your decisions throughout this DLC, Arya will either kill or spare the big bad guy here accordingly, which is actually way better than the cliched trope of pressing the Paragon button to stop Arya from killing the bad guy. I'm actually pretty happy about that. Because honestly, this guy was an oddly fair villain. He let Arya leave the station when he could have killed her. He warned us about his upgraded defenses and encouraged us to flee without bloodshed. He trapped us in a barrier without the intent of doing anything more until Arya goatseed the firewall. He doesn't seem like a horrible human, and has probably been twisted into thinking this way via the elusive man's influence. Overall, the Omega DLC is pretty solid, though it's definitely my least favorite so far. And that's not a bad thing, really, because something has to be at the bottom. The lukewarm start almost killed it for me, and the level design wasn't very great. But the actual narrative was put together in a way that wasn't necessarily predictable and involved some more interesting conversations and people. Though I do have to say that I really do think that this would have been better if we could have turned against Arya in favor for Nyrene. I mean, they really seem to hint at that a couple of different times. I wonder if they pulled out on that route at the last second. The new squad was a nice touch, and I felt more free to cut loose and choose the more renegade-ish options, which actually kept me guessing as to whether Arya would kill the final guy due to how it was approached. I didn't mention this earlier, but there's also an Engineer Class exclusive Paragon action which will cause Shepard to immediately override the generator without sacrificing anyone, which is also kind of a cool touch. 
it's a pretty solid DLC, even if it's not amazing. When all is said and done, Arya makes one final speech to her people, showcasing a softer side than usual due to her experience with you, even if that conceited part naturally shows through every here and there. It's a nice enough ending, and I'm glad that I played through this thing. Let's go begin our batch of quests which lead to the Quarians and the Geth finally. First off, we can wind up meeting with Jacob, who's in the middle of a firefight with some Cerberus forces after they've begun exterminating their own scientists after the events of the Project Overlord DLC in Mass Effect 2. I never completed that DLC, but the short version of this stuff is that the elusive man wanted a way to control the Geth, and was threatening his scientists with termination if they didn't get results. So this guy forced his autistic brother to fuse his mind with a VI in an attempt to do just that. Well, that didn't go over well, as his brother's mind then seized control of all of the Project Overlord systems, and they eventually had to nuke the place without Shepard there to shut it down. Now the elusive man has ordered these scientists to be wiped out because that's just how Cerberus operates. So this mission is kind of shoddy, seeing as Bioware tends to play fast and loose with how Metagel works or if it even exists as a plot device. Basically, Jacob gets shot in the gut shortly before Shepard arrives on the scene. This means that he's walking around all hunched over to keep his organs from falling out of his midsection. It also means that he now has to guide Shepard into doing the stuff that he would have had to do to evacuate the scientists here. Now for clarification as to why I feel the way I do about this mission, there are two separate missions that I've played in this game where people have sustained injuries. Actually, there's probably more than that, but there's two that stick out. The first was Commander Bailey on the Citadel, who was shot in the gut. For some reason, despite having zero implants to my knowledge, he's just able to run around and do everything that he would normally do, even though Shepard points out that he's been shot repeatedly. I don't know, maybe it just grazed him. But secondly, the lady who was posing as an intelligence officer also gets shot at the start of the Shore Leave DLC, and she claims that she just took a bunch of Metagel to get over it. So this point of Jacob not being able to do much is kind of a moot point when Shepard has eight chunks of Metagel on him. I guess I just would have liked it if the player could choose to heal him here in exchange for having less gel for the mission. I mean, I can't see why we couldn't fight alongside Jacob for this. Oh well. We also get an opportunity to speak to Jacob and catch up in a medical room with Metagel on the wall. While I didn't find him to be the most riveting character in the last game, I did view him as a kind of bro-type soldier comrade who became a good buddy to Shep after his loyalty mission involving Jacob's dad. We can ask him how he's been feeling about that, and he gives a short one-line answer. Okay? We can also ask him how he wound up here, and he claims that he had a midlife crisis after making it back intact from the suicide mission. He fell in love with one of the scientists here, and began a relationship with her, and now he wants to protect her and the people here. Eh, that's cool. And then he goes, Fuck you, Shepard, you don't know what it's like to love a person this much. Uh, thanks? The fuck, dude, what did I do to you? So yeah, I guess that was a fun catch up. I guess Bioware didn't really know what to do with him in any sort of substantial way after the second game. Though like I said, he's always been a pretty middle of the road character regardless. So this mission looks like this. After getting the AA guns repaired, Jacob asks if we should evacuate now or wait. We send the most useless, uh, I mean the, the most important people first, uh, which is a shuttle full of humans under 16. They get taken out by a Cerberus suicide bomber. Imagine signing on to help humanity and your heroic act of self-sacrifice is taking out a shuttle full of miners. There's no telling what those kids could have gotten up to. And yeah, I'll ruin the fun here. I know that the Cerberus troops are all indoctrinated fusions of man and machine, but it's still amusing to think about them losing their lives over petty shit like this. Anyways, we get the rest of them out and Jacob becomes the war asset. Let's go see Tally so I can have fun again. All right, so you know how in the last game there was this big back and forth between the Quarian leadership about whether or not they should try to take their homeworld back from the Geth? Well, it turns out that the decision has been made to go for it and the Quarians literally started a war between them and the Geth right before the Reapers showed up. Great timing. So this is gonna be a weird one since there's kind of a lot of background here from the second game, and while I won't recap it, there are a couple of things that we have to keep in mind about this whole situation. One, we helped Legion to free the Geth and allow them to break control of Reaper indoctrination. And two, Admiral Chorus here is the one Quarian leader who empathizes with the Geth and is now worried about the fact that the Quarian fleet has thrown its civilians to fight against the Geth. 
Regarding the first point, that shit didn't really seem to affect too much, as the Reapers just overrode the Geth upon their return to the Milky Way, effectively making our decision to help Legion a moot point as of right now. And regarding the second point, Chorus has always hated Tally, despite me agreeing with the idea that attacking the Geth would be bad, which has always put me in this awkward position when concurring with him on anything. Fortunately, Tally isn't involved in the meeting, but she does show up at the end of it to reveal that she's now an admiral in the Corian fleet. After a brief conversation and catch up with her, it's time to take the fight to the Geth. Since the Reapers have showed up and rewrote the Geth, they've become a lot more organized and battle ready. But that seems to be contingent on a Geth warship which is broadcasting a signal to do the rewriting. Our job now is to board that ship and undo what's been done to the machines, hopefully. The mission kicks off with Shepard using mag boots to navigate a structurally weak docking tube alone with the intent of checking to see if it's stable enough for the others to cross. Well, it isn't. And his next endeavor involves trying to open another tube up. I know this is another kind of scripted, no danger event, but I do kind of like it. And I wouldn't mind it if other events like this existed in the game. I like how Joker claims that the Geth could look out the window and see the Normandy is just sitting out there trying to board them. But Shepard says that the Geth don't use windows, which was how they infiltrated that Geth ship in the previous entry. The Geth are just sitting there saying, those organics would never try the no windows thing twice. As if Shepard using one of the Geth Dreadnought's docking tubes wouldn't alert them to the idea that they're being boarded and that they should be seeking out an enemy ship nearby. The mission itself is actually one of the better ones in terms of how the devs approach the level design. Instead of just having rooms filled with Geth, you also have a portion where you can navigate forward to deactivate the main cannon. Throughout it, the cannon keeps firing intermittently, sending out a shockwave of energy that completely wipes your shields. If you've been playing like I have and have put a very minimal importance on health, this is a scary room. Battle becomes frantic. Charging enemies was the only thing that kept me alive when I got hit with a shockwave and maneuvering to cover became a priority over the usual non-stop attacking that I tended to adopt while fighting. This was a cool fight that actually did something with the cover mechanics for Vanguard specifically, and I wish that there was more like it throughout the game. When we eventually make it to where the Reaper signal is being broadcast from, it's revealed that the Reapers have strung up and are using Legion to relay the signal and indoctrinate the Geth. Tally is skeptical but glad to see Legion, and Legion agrees to submit to any sort of restraint that we may want to put on it in order to see whether or not it's been indoctrinated as well. Now, I'm not 100% sure if this works the way the game says it does. I mean, it's all made up, so I have to take its word for it, right? But freeing Legion does make it so that the Reaper signal stops, right? But the Geths still fight us on our way out of the ship. So obviously there's still some control slash overwriting that's happening here. I mean, if I hadn't played through this before, I would have assumed that given the choice that I made with Legion in the previous game, every Geth would return back to the programming which Legion injected into them then. But that doesn't happen here. So the assumption here is that the Reapers straight up overwrote their coding, and the signal was just to help keep them organized and maintained. But when we make it back to the Normandy, Legion tells us that there's a short-range signal base on the Corian home planet as well, which will soon start broadcasting the same Reaper signal. And one of the Corian admirals claims that this means that those Geth are still going to be upgraded. This means that the signal doesn't straight up overwrite them. It controls them. So then why are the ones away from the planet still attacking us on our way out? Maybe I'm missing something here. Regardless, Legion powered down the Geth Dreadnought before we left it. And what the fleet promised it was going to do when we did that was full retreat so that its civilians weren't at risk. That's when the Admiral of the Heavy Fleet decided to initiate a full-blown attack on the Dreadnought with our squad still on it. Which is completely fucked, but hey, these guys also jury-rigged their civilian ships to fight in this war as well, so it's par for the Quarian course. When we get back, Hackett tells us that we need to win the Quarian support in order to take back Earth. <clears throat> Admiral, you jeopardized your mission and your people. Get the hell off my ship. So the next string of missions are a lot how Act 1's finale was structured, but with more impact. Basically, you can just rush to the planet and fuck shit up after completing only one side mission, but you'll wind up with less overall war assets and possibly not gain access to the best outcome of the final mission. The first mission has us rescuing Admiral Chorus, who decided that the most prudent way to use his ship was to kamikaze it into a single cannon on a planet full of cannons. There's been a lot of kamikazeing in this game. It's like the third time I've said it? Fourth? Something like that. I'm not a military expert, but I feel like the Admiral might have been more important in another role. 
Along the way, we find a busted up Quarian, who Shepard deems important enough to use the Metagel that he didn't want to use on Jacob. Turns out that Metagel's ingredients include Listerine and Clorox, as the guy dies soon after anyways. When we get through disabling the anti-air guns in an area that reminds me heavily of the Krogan manufacturing planet in the first game from a level layout perspective, we radio Admiral Chorus. The guy's like, no, don't save me, save my crew. And we're like, uh, yeah, they're all dead and we need you to lead here, brother. And he's like, shit, I was hoping to die here. And uploads his coordinates. Okay, weird. But we save him through another turret section. This one feels a lot better though since you're covering someone important as he escapes and doesn't necessarily feel as forced. If you don't save him here, the civilian part of the Quarian fleet goes into a full discombobulated panic, lending this action a lot more weight. Upon making it back, Chorus lightens up for once and thanks you for helping out, which actually feels good since he's always been so standoffish up until this moment. Now we can either engage in the final battle or help the housing part of the Quarian fleet which is getting hit by Geth fighter squadrons. Obviously, the latter is the way to go here, so that the fleet is at full force when we push in for the final battle. Now, the interesting bit here is that Legion has discovered that the Reaper upgrades have turned the Geth into something more sentient, a true AI. If we bring down that signal outright, that change will revert, causing the Geth to go back to what they were. Obviously, the Quarian Admiral that's in the war room wants us to destroy the Geth completely, but Legion wants to figure out a way to free its people as a true life form. I just like that Legion pulls up these examples of what the Geth AI core looks like with and without the Reaper interference. And Shepard's like, you see that shit? That's life, baby. I mean, yeah, I, I guess it's veiny looking. So to take out the fighters, which are hammering the Quarian fleet, we have to shut down a part of the server that's commanding those Geth. This could have easily been a, okay, go into this area and hit this button on a computer type of thing, which would have been par for the course. But BioWare wanted to do something a little different for this quest, and instead decided to have Shepard upload his consciousness with the previously mentioned Project Overlord stuff to basically go in and manually kill off the chunk of Geth which are operating the fighter squadron's bodies. This puts us into the Geth Consensus, which is the cyber world reminiscent of Tron. Legion claims that the Geth Consensus only looks this way to give Shepard some semblance of familiarity while navigating. In terms of gameplay, this whole thing has us following a path and clearing out Reaper-infected code before gaining access to the next level via an access point. Along the way, you can view recorded logs detailing key historical moments for the Geth. If that sounds semi-familiar, I'll have you know that Mass Effect 3 ripped off Fallout 4's Far Harbor DLC four years before it came out. I can't believe this. The memories themselves range from the creation of the Geth to the beginnings of their consciousness to the uprising itself. Wasn't that footage from the past? Why are the Quarians masked? BioWare didn't want to model unmasked Quarians just for this. Man, I've gotta say, while I've always been on the Geth side, I've never felt quite this bad about their predicament until I witnessed this stuff. Creator, this unit is ready to serve. What has it done wrong? What? Blitz. Cut the audio. As you continue through the consensus, it becomes clear that the Geth remembered those Quarians who stood counter to the displays of violence against Geth who just wanted to understand their newfound consciousness. If you were still on the fence about which side to help out more, I imagine that these logs expertly painted the picture for you. When all is said and done, we shut down the Geth squadron and gain some new allies in the form of these Prime units which Legion has convinced to join it. Now we're ready to conclude Act 2, which I prepare for by mopping up a lot of Citadel side questing which I had left over. There's not too much more to mention here, though it is worth noting that Samara is here to give Shep one last goodbye before going to join the battle. Jacob is also around and fills you in on the work on the Crucible. Miranda goes off to do her thing with her sister, and Zaid actually makes an appearance, though it's nowhere near as big as Kasumi's was. It's funny because I was actually okay with Zaid not being as willing to fill in Shepard about his life since Cerberus, but it turns out that he's actively hunting down Cerberus members while not giving a shit about money, which is very counter to Zaid's character from before seeing how he was a pure mercenary through and through with one hangup involving his old Merc outfit. So now I was interested to know what had changed, but he just goes, hey man, all right, I uh, heard you need some help. I'll uh, round up the boys to fight the Reapers. And that's it. Uh, I guess I'll just assume that he was mad about the suicide mission or something instead of turning over a new leaf, I don't know. All right, back to the Quarians. So the battle plan is to drop in with Legion in tow and have it gain access to an escape vehicle and the Geth systems here. 
Meanwhile, we're to use a targeting laser to have the Normandy drop in and precision strike the Reaper part of the Geth structures with a device to more or less EMP the Geth and shut them down. Legion itself is a lot more human than it was before, and it tends to show visible confusion at that. It isn't quite the same level of humanity that Edie exudes, but it does show bashfulness, a desire to cover up small truths in order to protect itself from scrutiny, and concern for its people and the Quarians. It's a very cool process to see, as it also went from being a very direct machine to developing more of a personality like Edie. So when the whole thing goes down, it turns out that the Reaper tech that was installed here was actually a Reaper, causing a fast and dramatic shift to the plan. Shepard decides to have the Normandy's targeting laser synced up to the Quarian fleet so that they can precisely bombard the Reaper when it opens up its weak point that it has to expose in order to fire its weapons. The actual mechanics of this fight aren't that invigorating, but I suppose they're cool to look at. Since it's hard to engage how large the hitbox is on the laser as it shoots at you, the correct thing to do is to just run to the other side and prime the targeting beam, which again, isn't super involved. When all is said and done, the Reaper falls and reveals a tiny fragment of why they're doing what they're doing. What's funny is that if you've played the Leviathan DLC at this point, you know exactly why the Reapers invade every 50,000 years. But without that knowledge, this sounds like gibberish. Like I said, we'll get to that towards the end, but this whole situation is a lot funnier than you might think if you have no idea what's going on. Alright, so here's the big decision for this act. This one has several different outcomes that stem directly from your decisions in the previous game, and is probably one of the biggest points of replayability in Mass Effect 3. So what this comes down to is this. You either choose to destroy the Geth, or you allow them to merge with the Reaper code and become fully sentient. Choosing either one will cause either Tally or Legion to get upset with you. But this is where the third option comes in. If your reputation is high enough with either Paragon or Renegade, and you've done several different things in both this game and the previous one, you can manage to get both the Quarians and the Geth to coexist peacefully. The factors involved require both Legion and Tally to be alive after the previous game. To get the best ending here, you'll also have had to complete at least one of their loyalty missions a certain way. Legion has to have set the heretics free, and Tally has to have been absolved from her crimes and not exiled. These are the most important factors here, but even doing both of them alone won't cause this situation to work out. Having both of these factors working for you requires one more component out of three. Component one is completing the mission where you go to rescue Admiral Chorus. Component two is actually saving Chorus in that mission. And component three is stepping in between an argument which Tally and Legion have in Mass Effect 2 where it turns out that Legion was snooping through Tally's messages. If you don't have the loyalty of one of these two, you must have all three of these components in order to get this coexistence option. I know that was a lot, but I really like this system. There are so many factors here, and while there are only three outcomes, I do like the legwork involved in getting the best outcome. That said, I was technically good to go with the setup that I performed in Mass Effect 2, as only two of these factors exist solely in this game alone. So if you ran into Mass Effect 3 without playing 2, your options are limited to choosing between the Geth or the Quarians. If you decide to go with the Geth, the Quarians all die in the counterattack from the newly sentient Geth, and Tally throws herself off of the cliff here. If you choose the Quarians, Legion attacks Shepard, who's forced to kill it, and the Geth get wiped out by their creators. But as things stand in my game, Shepard tells Legion to upload the Reaper code, and Tally begs him not to let this happen. Shep then rallies the fleet and lets them know that if they retreat, the Geth won't attack anymore. With the help of Chorus and every other factor mentioned before, the fleet stands down, bringing a tentative peace between the two forces. Legion realizes that in order to push the intelligence into its people, it would have to sacrifice itself to complete the injection. I like this scene a lot, as Tally tells Legion that she believes that it does have a soul. I know Tally, but thank you. When all is said and done, both sides volunteer to help with the Reapers, and the Geth allow the Quarians to settle back on their home planet. It feels really good, like all of the choices that I made regarding these two forces mattered. And as mentioned earlier, I couldn't recall many big moments like that stemming from this game. Tally decides to return with you to the Normandy as your final crew member, leaving us to finally being able to evaluate the companions of this game. But before I continue on to the companion roundup, let's jump over to my sponsor for this video, Displate. Every once in a while, you may stumble onto an art piece so beautiful, so wonderful looking, that you think to yourself, wow, 
Gosh, I sure wish that this was a thin slice of metal so that I could utilize some sort of proprietary magnet system to mount it on my wall and cherish it until I get bored of looking at it. Now that may seem like a very specific desire in this mortal coil, but I assure you that it's such a widespread phenomenon that there's an entire company based around taking these moments of pleasing pictorializations and producing powerful pictures of perfection. Enter Displate. Now it's been about a half a year since my first Displate sponsorship and the old boys are still hanging in there making my life prettier. But it's magic season, and I desire some slick art to go with my Kamigawa Neon Dynasty packs that I just set my money on fire for. Fortunately, one of the best things about Displate is how easy it is to swap out your plates when it's time to redecorate for the season. So in this corner we have black, and in this one we've got white. And if you ever see any blue decorations in my home, please alert the authorities because something has gone very wrong. Regardless, we need one more for the old middle ground here. And I think it's high time that I got myself some Divinity Original Sin decoration into my life. But I know that my idea of decoration isn't always up to everyone's tastes, which is why Displate's officially licensed selection spans a pretty sizable quantity of franchises across all forms of entertainment media. And even if you're not feeling very franchisey, there are plenty of artists showcasing their hard work for you to pick up. From there, it's a four to five day expected delivery time in which your plates are printed off in the EU and sent your way. Then you just have to slap that metal onto the magnet onto the sticker onto the wall. I promise that there is an easier way to explain that which will be included in your purchase. And that's all there is to it. If you use my discount link in the description, you can grab your displates on the cheap for the next month. If any of that sounds like something you could use in your life, feel free to check out Displate. Thanks, guys. Speaking with Mass Effect 3's companions feels like they finally got this whole system nailed down in the end, which is awesome to see. I'm not saying that every one of them is inherently more interesting or better than the older companions, I mean that talking itself feels right. Where Mass Effect 1 always had you walking up to a squad mate, going into the dialogue mode and then seeing if there were any new options, and Mass Effect 2 had companions giving you the exact same line of dialogue every time they had nothing new to say to you, Mass Effect 3 usually has your squad telling you something that they've been thinking about or something relating to the previous mission without hitting you with the exact same line of dismissal dialogue every time. Liara tells you the time that she visited the Turian homeworld when she was a child. James comments on how Victus is a badass. Garrus mentions that it's good to see Jack in a better place, and so on. And it feels a lot more real, more like naturally occurring conversations that don't have you hearing the same shit over and over. This whole back and forth actually goes on to extend to the other crew members aboard the Normandy, such as Cortez who works on the small crafts in the hangar, or Trainer who hangs out near the galaxy map. And while I won't actually get into their different background stories or the conversations that you have with them, I don't think that I've ever felt closer to my crew in any other game just due to this crew's likability and interesting personalities. I think my favorite part, even though it can get a little annoying to track them down, is the fact that these guys will move around and talk to other members aboard the Normandy. They'll exchange stories, reminisce, and check on each other's well-being during this harrowing time. And it makes the ship feel very alive. Hello, Shepard. Oh, I guess we're just smoking on the ship then? <coughs> is, is that meth? Do they make meth cigarettes now? God, I hate the future. The whole companion system has much less of a focus on your squad's individuality and more of a spotlight on their general personality and how they're dealing with the events which have unfolded. So while you won't be taking them on loyalty missions to secure their trust, you're instead free to outright ignore them without it affecting your game. It's a system that I liked immediately, especially given that a good chunk of loyalty missions in Mass Effect 2 seemed like they were shoehorned in to ensure the survival of your crew, rather than the writers having an actual story to tell that plays into the bigger tale that the series portrays. So while I will do my standard companion ranking thing that I tend to do with Bioware games, I want to make it clear that there's much less focus on the companions' personal lives and more of a focus on their thoughts revolving around the galaxy being ravaged. So Caden has grown into his own person a bit more in the third game, but that growth has come with a heap of flaws which have been built off of the whole conflict in the second game. Where in Mass Effect 1, Caden was a bit more unquestioning and willing to serve Shepard with few rebuttals, he starts out in this game as wholly skeptical of which side Shepard is playing for. As much as I tore him a new one in Mass Effect 2 for being a little too clingy, I do understand to a degree the betrayal that he felt, as he continued to rise through the ranks of the system's alliance. 
That said, his questioning of Shepard at the start gets a little old when it becomes clear that literally nothing Shepard can say is going to convince Caden that Shep's still the same guy that he was before he died. By the way, I gotta say here that I definitely referred to the Alliance as the Council repeatedly in the Mass Effect 2 video because I'm a dummy. So yeah, let's uh, get that out of the way now. Anyways. Eventually, after Caden recovers a bit more from his accidental lobotomy, the near-death experience seems to have jostled a lot of those doubts away. The two former comrades make up and forgive each other, turning a new chapter in their friendship. It's nice to see, and I don't feel like it's too sudden just because, well, the guy almost died. Had this not happened to him and he suddenly was just like, ah, oh, yeah, all right, I was wrong, after some random mission, I think I might have raised a little bit more concern there. But I think the way this forgiveness quest was approached was fine with the context surrounding it. After another mission or two, Caden is back on his feet, and is offered the Spectre position for some reason. I mean, I'm sure that he deserves it. It just seems weird to watch someone nearly die and the Council go, hmm, yes, Spectre material. I'm sure that Odina had something to do with that, maybe just trying to get him in as a personal bodyguard or something. But either way, Caden accepts his new role and hesitates about rejoining the Normandy at first, instead staying out of the picture until Act 2's Citadel attack. When it does come time for Caden to rejoin us, he starts by going, Okay, so, um, if I tried to stop you back there with Udina, uh, would you have shot me too? I don't know how someone can go from trusting to untrusting to trusting to untrusting as quickly as this man does. But boy, does he pull it off. Shepard convinces Caden for a third time this game that he's still who he's always been. And this time, Caden decides to fully trust Shepard again. What a wild ride. After he gets his mind in order, it becomes clear that a lot more is weighing on it than Shepard's loyalty to the Alliance. He tells you about his dad dying in the Reaper attack, and how his mom is all alone now. Having a human companion to talk to this stuff about is nice, and it brings a bit of reality to the idea of floating around in a ship light years away from your home planet which is being torn asunder. Hey, I bumped into Edie in the hall. Scared the shit out of me. Now all of that said, you have to understand that what the player sees is a guy who has a history with Shepard, sure. But then he had a falling out that has flip-flopped between trusting and not trusting Shepard repeatedly. And then when the dust finally settles, Caden immediately says to Shepard, hey, I just want you to know that I find you extremely handsome and would love to slather my dong in and around your mouth. Which is a little fast, you know? Like again, I get the history, uh, but this whole conversation harkens back to the problem a lot of Mass Effect 2 squad members had, which was that they would go from slightly warm to wanting to bang in a matter of a conversation with hardly any buildup. It's just a quick leap that warranted a few more close moments before getting right down to it. Overall, Caden is, uh, he's all right. Yes, there's a natural history involved with his presence, which is always welcome, but he seems to be caught in this paranoid loop. And while I'm not sitting here going, wow, how unreasonable, I do think that he's not the most fun character to talk to. I would actually argue that my opinion of his personality has regressed over the course of this series, which might make him the only character that that's happened with. Vega's a weird character in the mix, as the approach to talking to him is wholly different from every other companion that's been in any of these games. I initially didn't really like him, but eventually warmed up to the guy after a few conversations. He's a standoffish, hot-headed bruiser type who mixes in Spanish words with his speech while constantly working out to keep his body in shape. He's a reckless soldier who doesn't care if he dies as long as he goes down fighting. He's basically a human Krogan in a lot of ways. As such, your first talk with him has him dismissing you while he does pull-ups before you eventually make it clear that you're not leaving. This eventually evolves into sparring while Shepard quizzes James, allowing for you to get in some good hits with the Renegade action while dodging with the Paragon one. The quiz results in James relaying that he was once part of a unit in charge of protecting a civilian colony from a Collector attack, which resulted in him saving important intel which could have been used to take down the Collectors instead of saving the colony. Fortunately, Shepard was in the middle of destroying the Collectors with his crew right around this time. Unfortunately, this meant that Vega had sacrificed the colony to save the data for nothing. Shepard immediately picks up on this and links it to his reckless behavior on Mars when he crashed his shuttle into the escaping shuttle with the elusive man's agent in it. So while James might put on the tough guy act and constantly focus on physical activities, you can tell that stuff like this weighs on his mind and that he's trying to drown it out but he's definitely a pretty cookie-cutter soldier type for the most part. Likes kicking ass, getting the job done, and protecting his people. 
And unfortunately, it becomes pretty damn apparent early on that this is all he really is. Even when he does come up to discuss his doubts about being promoted to the N7 program, which he received a recommendation for, a lot of what it boils down to him is reliving that one moment where people died under his command. Which, yeah, sure, that's a traumatic experience, but it's really all his character has to offer. He doesn't bring up Earth the same way that Caden does, or talk about anything to do with the galaxy falling apart beyond some minor dialogue. If there was one character that I could have given a loyalty-type mission to, it would be James, as a lot of his conversation devolves into small quips about whatever mission that you just completed, and that's all that he's really got. He's not a bad character, there's nothing offensive about him by any means. It just feels like he's filling a role, and I honestly would have rather seen pretty much any other squad member from the previous game make a return here as a member over him. Liara has undergone the most drastic transformation of character from game to game, but not in a bad way. Where the first game has her taking on a more naive persona, the second game has her transforming to take on a more direct and ruthless identity. By the time the third game rolls around, she's now built up a much thicker skin, which is reflected even in the way that she talks. I never properly thanked you for saving me from the Geth Commander. If you hadn't shown up after you left for Earth, I had the chance to track down the information traitor who'd kidnapped my friend. Her voice is now deeper and less excited. Her demeanor is more professional and exudes the temperament of someone who's seen a lot of the darker side of what the galaxy has to offer. But at the same time, her formerly optimistic demeanor has melted into a more pragmatic or even pessimistic at times attitude, causing her to wonder if all of the scurrying from area to area is a fool's errand in the face of such overwhelming odds, and blaming herself if literally anything could be perceived as her fault. Regardless, Liara has taken on the role of the Shadow Broker, which is something that I skipped in aiding her with in the last game. A lot of people wanted to see me cover that one since apparently it's pretty important. Thumbing through the wiki reveals that it actually sounded like a pretty fleshed out DLC, but I really didn't want to spend more time than the four hours that I had on Mass Effect 2. From what I can tell in terms of how the DLC affects the third game, it only really reflects whether or not Shepard knows about what happened or not. I know this sounds weird, but somehow her getting it done without Shepard makes her more of a badass in my eyes. I mean shit, there's a lot that you can contribute to Shepard's expert combat skills and bravery. But if you miss this DLC, it means that Liara marched into the Shadow Broker's lair with a platoon of hired mercs, and took it all over without Shep's help. That's cool, man. Given that I romanced Liara in Mass Effect 1, the option does come up to rekindle that flame. Though of course you don't jump right back into fucking, as Liara is very busy doing her Shadow Broker thing. With the way that these games are structured, you don't get to casually bang until locking in a romance, as you have to wait until the end with a few warm moments sprinkled in here and there. Flatterer. I try. Given enough time, Liara does ask for Shepard to call her up to his quarters. So, I put a plan in motion to preserve things for the future. That is not the box I thought she was going to give him. Yeah, we're not at the romance yet, as Liara instead wants Shepard's input on preserving a time capsule for future races, much in the way the Protheans did during their time to warn future civilizations of the Reapers. It's a touching scene that shows that Liara hasn't completely shifted from that younger, more sentimental version of herself. Eventually, you can get your romance lock option when you listen to Liara talk about her childhood on the Citadel. And I'm sure that it's great, but there's a bit of an issue. She isn't Tally. Liara, I... Be with whoever you want to be with. I'm just not interested in playing games anymore. Really, I don't believe either of us has the time. Holy fuck, props to the voice actress for this one. I felt that. Yeah, Liara is not happy after you choose someone else even if you initially said that you were interested in her. And she actually shows it even in casual dialogue at first when dismissing you. I'm occupied, Shepard. Jesus, man. I mean, I get it, but that is some stone-cold shit. Liara's always been a great addition to this series, and the way that she's grown over the course of it fits her in a way that I wouldn't have guessed if you had showed me the end result after only playing the first game. She's grown to accept her role in the galaxy as someone who's capable of stepping up to the plate and being what it needs the most. She's a historian who absolutely loves studying other cultures. She's the shadow broker who fought tooth and nail to access the resources that she has at her disposal and she's indispensable to the well-being of the galaxy species. I'm not going to have a ton to say about Garrus just because he's been involved in every game so far, 
but it's definitely interesting to see how he's changed now that the Reapers have attacked his home world, potentially killing his father and sister. The war has changed his perspective a bit on how small everything seemed when he was just a rogue CSEC agent playing fast and loose with the rules, causing him to harden a little more than he already had when playing Space Batman in the second game. He's always been stubborn, which is probably why he's here today. As such, his prediction about our odds of success are about as accurate as they've always been, as Shepard again asks what he thinks their chances are. Garrus replies by stating that he believes that they can win, but not without casualties, mirroring what he said about the threat in the second game. I think the more interesting bits here involve the reconciliation with Garrus' father, and the results which stemmed from it. In the first game, Garrus trashes his father more or less as a goody-two-shoes, by-the-books kind of CSEC officer, which pissed him off because criminals would get away when people took that mentality and were afraid to bend the rules. But in Garrus' words, he went to his father after it became apparent that the Reapers had arrived in Batarian space, and his father listened to everything that Garrus told him. After that, his father went to his Turian leader friend and wound up convincing him to at least put Garrus in charge of a task force to help prepare for the Reapers. Of course, this was just a token gesture as no one really believed that the Reapers existed still, but it did lead to Garrus doing as much as he could to brace against the incoming hostiles, which hopefully helped in some minor way at the very least. But there really isn't a lot more to say about Garrus. Much like the rest of the crew so far, I know that this roundup is woefully short compared to the previous two entries, but Garrus is the one constant besides Tally in this game who was involved at every step. As such, we know a lot of his background, and we can only really speculate on how much he's changed from game to game. With his changes being a lot more drastic from game 1 to 2, there really isn't too much more to cover here beyond various conversations in which he gives the same optimistically realistic takes. The final meetup that you can have with him really showcases that rebellious streak which had started to take root in the first game, as he claims that he always wanted to fly up to the top of the Presidium Commons area despite all of the regulations in place keeping him from doing so. At the potential end of the galaxy, Garrus decides that he's going to do it anyway, leading into a shooting competition between him and the Commander. It felt like the perfect way to sum up everything that Garrus has been through, and the person that he's become. He's a great character, and it's been fun to ride through all of these trials with him at our side. You're not going to propose marriage now, are you? It's hard to talk about an AI the same way I would regard a human, but Edie's slowly gained more of a personality throughout the events of Mass Effect 2, even showing a fondness for Joker at one point. In this game, she's more or less a very calculating human with a crazy amount of intelligence, but still understands the value of friendship and the varying emotional states that humans can undergo. Edie is a huge asset to this team. If she'd told me about her plan to obtain a body, I'd have volunteered to help. I did not wish to force a conflict of interest between our friendship and your duty. As such, she does seem to care more deeply about Joker, calling him by his real name and getting embarrassed when he comments on her new body. Okay, let me put it this way. If I knew that Edie was going to install herself into a sexy robot body, do you honestly think I'd be able to keep quiet about it? Look at that! I would have baked a cake. I am right here, Jeff. Edie's big conflict that she has is that she currently obeys orders from her commanding officers without question. But since she's been constantly tweaking herself and the way that she thinks, she's now stumbled onto the idea that sometimes she has moral objections to certain orders and has been wondering whether or not she should obey unquestioningly or use her own judgment. It's a complex issue that only she can offer. Well, I suppose that Legion offered something similar in the end. But regarding our crew for this game, we have Edie. When facing these issues of judgment, Shepard can guide her along the path of choosing things for herself or continuing to obey him and whoever else without question. I don't believe this actually affects what she winds up becoming, but I guess the potential possibilities are nice to think about. Beyond these occasional inquiries to ask the tougher moral questions, Edie basically enjoys learning new things and experimenting on parts of the Normandy. She explains the process of liking something as her being programmed to prioritize different occurrences as higher or lower depending on their importance, and then using those occurrences to generate positive or negative feedback based on their outcomes. For example, the crew now approach her body instead of just asking questions anywhere on the ship since she can hear them anywhere, which she says that she enjoys. Do not worry, Shepard. I only forget to recycle the Normandy's oxygen when I've discovered something truly interesting. That was a joke. She's a fun character and I really like talking to her more than I thought I would. Progressing through the game has Edie throwing harder questions at you, 
as she realizes that she could become obsolete a lot quicker than she had anticipated when she witnessed the Thresher Maw take down the Reaper on Tachanka. She had been quietly comparing her purpose to that of the Geth or the Reapers for a while now, tottering between the idea of organic life serving to replicate itself and give birth to future generations, and what synthetic life's purpose is. The end result of this conversation winds up with Edie granting a higher priority to the human values of altruism and love, which shows up more later when you speak to her about the topic of her and Joker. As time goes on and you visit Edie on her shore leave on the Citadel, it becomes clear that she has realized that Joker has feelings for her. She wants to reciprocate them but hasn't quite grasped the finer points of what a romantic relationship is supposed to look like, as her programming hasn't been suited for ideas of music or conventional romantic gifts. But she does have a soft spot for humor, which results in her deciding to purchase tickets to a comedy show. Though Shepard can warn her that it isn't about the show itself as much as it's about her company, it's unclear whether or not she understands that yet. And this whole plotline where both Edie and Joker ask Shepard what he thinks of the two carries on for quite a few conversations. Which is funny considering how little Caden talked about his feelings before giving Shepard the old one-two. Regardless, Edie and Joker both do eventually wind up together, and Edie begins slowly but surely emulating Joker's mannerisms and way of talking. She doesn't completely change her personality, she'll just occasionally drop little expressions that she didn't say before. And as time goes on, she begins to speak more and more like a human might, with the biggest example that I saw stemming from an argument between her and Javik about whether or not she was valid as a form of life or not. And what if your upgrade endangers others? All machines eventually see organics as a threat. Only those organics who would cause me harm. My right to self-defense endangers no one. What rights do you have? You are just a tool. And what right do your people have to subjugate the other races of your time? You enslaved them. True life is more than a code upgrade. It is shaped by the forces around us. Machines are immune to those forces. You exist outside of nature. We are a part of this cosmos, whether you like it or not. But I think that's about going to be it for Edie. She's a great character, and the only reason that I wouldn't rate her higher is because you didn't really converse with her as much in the previous game, even if you did get to see her personality develop there too. She turns from a very straight-laced and humorless AI to one with a lot more personality and self-reflection, and that experience is very fun to watch unfold. If there's one word to describe Javik, it's intense. Where you might be able to look at a human with his attitude and think that he's edgy, or a Krogan and think that that's just the way that a Krogan is, Javik embodies a desire for vengeance so strong that he can hardly contain himself. As a soldier on the front lines during his people's final moments, you get to witness the bravery, the fear, and the cunning of the Protheans, which finally fleshes them out as more than just these weird bug-like creatures who were supposedly way more advanced than the current era of life. The emotion which is conveyed through these final moments is powerful in a way that isn't filled with sadness as much as despair and doubt. Many of the other life pods were destroyed in the Reaper onslaught. The rest had their power cut to keep Javik's going, and Javik was informed of all of this right before he was knocked out in what felt like a few minutes, waking up to these primitive species looming over him and chattering at him. It's honest to God something that you wouldn't feel the full brunt of unless you experienced it through his eyes, and Bioware conveyed those emotions masterfully. As such, Javik is standoffish towards other species, not viewing them as equals, shaking Shepard down for not being able to prepare more for the Reaper threat, and generally being just angry. He only cares about one thing, destroying the Reapers in a fury of vengeance. It's a mantle that he took up to preserve his sanity, his dignity, and his legacy. His overwhelming intelligence and little patience define his very being, and I absolutely love how different he is from everyone else that we've encountered. In a way, his attitude reminds me of the Kunari from Dragon Age. The way that he talks, looks at other races, and his general demeanor all exude a very straightforwardness which is shared with the Kunari. That being said, it's not like he's completely uncooperative, as he does answer our questions in an effort to help in any small way against the Reapers. I found that surprising given that he feels like he literally was just fighting the Reapers in his time, but that may point more towards his intelligence and wisdom to overcome his emotions. Javik claims that the Protheans enslaved all other intelligent life that didn't obey the Empire, but also embraced those willing to join them. His people saw it as a necessity to help them fight against intelligent machine life, eventually including the Reapers. 
The Protheans were even keeping an eye on the potential of new species that were starting to evolve, and would have eventually extended an offer to join the Protheans or be left to die. Of course, this attitude wound up being a liability in the long run, as the Reapers soon figured out that throwing the leadership into disarray caused panic among the subservient races, ultimately resulting in their victory. Javik also details the ability for most Protheans to be able to communicate a thousand thoughts and ideas through a simple touch, which they then fused into technology, explaining the beacon which Shepard touched in the first game. He even goes on to sense that the room that he's inhabiting on the ship used to be Grunt's, while being able to tell just how strong he was from the remaining DNA left over from his pod's liquid. It's an overwhelming display of superiority from the Prothean soldier, one which makes me glad that he's on our side. I had no idea Protheans were so... severe. Apparently Liara's impressed too. But the conclusion of our initial conversation has Javik ready to serve, which was not what I expected from the guy, only further denoting his drive for revenge. Crew reactions all seem to be about what you'd expect, with most of them saying the phrase, a real live Prothean, ad nauseum. Garrus understands his drive for revenge. Edie's trying to get him to understand gendered bathrooms. Liara's fucking soaked. James actually has the insight to convey that he might not be mentally stabled after traveling from one reality to another in the blink of an eye. And this goes on and on with other crew members. Javik doesn't seem to mind still going off of his memories of every other race being primitive. The things that he has to say about other races does get pretty funny at times though as it's clear that he might never really see eye to eye with people cooperating together. We can't win this war on our own. Then demand their help. Do not indulge their selfish requests. What will saving one Krogan matter? If only it were that simple. If they get in your way, destroy them. Excuse me? I apologize. The previous occupant of this room left traces of himself. I have absorbed some of them. Yes, Grunt. They say he was a strong one. It's something that the Protheans valued among all else. The idea that the strongest race would survive, thrive, and rule the galaxy. Thus, it confuses Javik when people try to be his friend. Almost as much as the idea that every race is now working together to try to keep as many alive as possible. It's funny because I know that a lot of this summary has been more about the Protheans themselves. But I mean, this is really where I thought it would fit the most. The Protheans have always been viewed as a wise elder race who managed to invent and establish technology beyond this cycle's wildest dreams. And Javik takes that idea and goes, Oh, we were really advanced to you? Hmm. Have you tried enslaving and killing your enemies? I mean, it makes sense in that regard, but Liara seems to have a hard time battling the disillusionment that she's facing when talking to someone as stern as Javik is. And it makes for a really interesting set of plot points. Javik probably would get along with the Salarians, truth be told, especially with his views on the Genophage situation. Had it been up to him, he would have taken the Salarian detail and lied to the Krogans about the cure being dispersed, which is an option as mentioned before. Eventually, you can meet up with Javik on the Citadel, who stands in awe at the scope of it. Well, maybe awe is a little strong of a word, but he does explain that his people used to tell tales of the Citadel as if it were a mythical place, seeing as none of them had been alive long enough to have seen it at the stage that he was born in. As Javik and Shepard talk, others around Javik notice him as an alive Prothean. When the topic of their annihilation is broached, Javik begins a wartime general type speech that probably would have resulted in an overall negative vibe. With a Paragon action, Shepard can gently redirect him to reel it in a bit, turning the abysmal speech into something with a bit more hope ingrained into it. It's one of the kinder notions that Javik has displayed throughout his time with us, and it does show that he's slowly beginning to warm up to the idea of being surrounded by younger races. But I think that's all I really have on Javik right now, just because running through every little quip and reaction to events is going to get redundant. While I do like him a lot, I would say that the most interesting parts about him tend to be what he is, not who he is. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing at all. For the most part, Javik is a vessel to deliver the information about this race of people who have been entangled in every game of the series. I'm not saying that he couldn't have been goofier or, or more energetic, but I do think that it would have been harder to present a race of galactic conquerors that way. He does make the occasional joke and learns to lighten up a bit as he adapts to the people around him, which is always fun to see. But for the most part, his direct and bold demeanor really helps to paint the image of his people in a way that causes the player to view the Protheans in a new light. 
and I really enjoyed listening to how taken aback Liara was at that. Tally has definitely changed a bit between Mass Effect 2 and 3, probably more so than anyone else. Well, maybe Edie. That's not to say that she's a completely different person, but she's now more confident in where she's gotten to in life. She's a lot like Liara in that regard, though Liara exhibited the bigger leap from the first game to the second. Even at the end of Mass Effect 2, Tally was still pretty wary of Legion and the Geth in general. She didn't trust them at all, and would hover more towards the idea of the Geth being destroyed rather than being made allies. That position has flip-flopped, which is made apparent immediately upon meeting Tally when she tells you that she's reconsidered her position on attacking the Geth after conversing with Legion and getting to understand it better. I like that change personally, since I've always viewed the Geth the same way that I would view Edie. That said, when it comes down to the big battle between the Quarians and the Geth, that older distrust of the machines is naturally dredged up. I initially wanted to point that out as contradictory, but people don't always immediately change at the drop of a hat. And undue stress in perilous situations tend to bring back those old emotions and thoughts to the forefront. But even given her obvious skepticism of Shepard's plan to allow Legion to upload the Reaper code, she still goes along with it, ordering the fleet to back down without any question. But this isn't the only way that Tally has shifted and grown as a character. I know this is going to seem a little fast compared to the other romanceable characters, but with Tally being the only one for male ship that was involved in the last game as a romance option, she immediately brings it up. Which honestly feels a lot more natural. I mean, don't get me wrong, Liara brings up the fact that her and Shep were entangled in the first game relatively quickly, but there's still a bit of time before she gets around to that discussion. Which was also a good call in terms of pacing there, and was nothing like Caden's sudden interest after rejoining the Normandy. But with Tally, that awkwardly cute mask of not knowing how to explain that she wanted an intimate relationship has now fallen away, as she immediately requests that Shepard call her up to his cabin. If you want to talk in private, Maybe you could invite me up to your cabin? Maybe I could. And for the record, still totally worth it. That said, Tally doesn't come up with the intent to pounce Shepard as the burden of sudden leadership weighs very heavily on her mind. She's upset with the way that her father left so much in her lap, and she's absolutely terrified of making the wrong decision and costing her people their lives. You can tell that she's stressed beyond belief, and that responsibility involved is draining her at every turn. Eventually, she states that the reason why she took on this role was because she saw what Shepard had accomplished, and the sacrifices that he had made. At this point, you can choose to rekindle the relationship if you want. Which, I mean, I haven't quite been obscure with my choice here. Kila Shepard. I'm not going to beg, but I didn't come up here just to see the fish. Okay. Normally I'd kiss you, but you got that whole mask thing happening, so, uh, damn, you got some nice elbows, girl. But that's about as far as romance goes for now, as Tally has much bigger concerns having been thrust into a war as a leader. According to her, she never even wanted the position, but felt that it was her duty to her people when they developed tech that could cripple the Geth's ability to communicate with each other. She claims that she was approached because her father's spot still hadn't been filled, and because she had the most recent contact with and knowledge of the Geth out of all of the Quarians. She had communicated a bit with Legion through messages, though that communication was cut off eventually on Legion's end, and Tally never warned it that her people were going to attack. The new confidence that Tally exudes actually extends even into the missions which you take her on, as her dialogue almost becomes more flirtatious in tone. Thank you for having me over. Well, I don't actually know where I'm going. Holy shit! shit. Hmm. I'll see what I can do. How come I don't get a new gun? Wouldn't find one in your size. It's an interesting and more direct approach for the formerly shy Quarian, and it's cool to see a lot of the dialogue being affected with her and Shepard officially together. I appreciate what you're doing here, Shepard. Well, I care deeply about the Quarian people. It's good to be back on the Normandy. Let me know if it's too quiet for you to sleep, and I'll find you someplace louder. Hmm. As you continue to progress, this new dialogue becomes a lot more direct, and it lends a lot more emotional impact on moments revolving around the Corian missions. 
Tally's always been pretty strongly anchored to her Corian background, but it doesn't quite manifest the same way that it does in Mass Effect 3. Where she might have been all about the fleet and how it operates before, the idea of longing for her home planet has always been a faint seed of her character that was slow to sprout until now. When taking back Rannoch from the Geth, this small bud blooms into a much bigger part of her character, one that had almost been repressed until this reality where her people decided to take back their home. And while this does lead to some pretty mixed emotions out of Tally, it does make her a lot more relatable as well. When the dust settles, that mixture of feelings coalesces into a surge of relief and mourning. The sorrowful remorse for the loss of those close to her throughout these games meets the elated peace of mind that comes with finally winning back Tally's home of Rannoch. And while this probably isn't the most amazing sequence to those not as fond of Tally as a character, I personally got a lot of enjoyment out of the scene that closes out Act 2. While I'm sure there's more to come for our Corian companion, I imagine that this is probably going to be a great place to stop with the full-blown analysis for now. She's a great character, one who grew from being someone who was more or less just an info dump about the Quarians, who developed from someone who was unsure and just wanted to get some life experience out of her pilgrimage and wound up finding her place in the galaxy as a leader of her people. When we make it back to the Normandy, the final act kicks off a lot more tamely than the previous one, at least for now. The Asari counselor is impressed with your progress, and claims to have some information for Shepard personally, urging him to meet her on the Citadel. It is worth noting that we have a new swath of conversations to go through with the crew, which range from the standard, hell of a mission, huh? To stuff with a little more substance. Edie notes that Legion referred to itself as I instead of we in its final moments, insinuating its final transition into something with individuality instead of speaking for a consensus like it had been. Garrus begins to realize what it's like to be a leader whose every answer can cost tens of millions of lives, which is a good full circle moment when Shepard suggests that he can handle it the way that he used to handle CSEC. Javik claims that he simply just would have destroyed the Geth, and that he doesn't trust the Corians since they all wear masks, which is very… Javik. Ironically, Tally tells us that the Geth have not only been making rapid changes to the landscape to help the Corians rehouse themselves, but that they've also been uploading themselves to the Corian suits in order to mimic small infections and create pseudo-vaccines, forcing their people to undergo a transformation that will allow them to not wear the suits in a couple of years. Maybe Javik will trust them then. Oh, and also, Tally leaves a maskless picture of herself by your bedside if you're romancing her, which has been updated in the remaster. It used to be a photoshopped version of this picture, and it didn't make a lot of sense, nor did it look very good. But now it looks like this, which is better. Alright, back to the Citadel where I turn in the last of my scanning missions. There were quite a few of them throughout the game, but with the changes to scanning, they weren't too bad, honestly. We also meet with Miranda one more time who still insists on chasing after her sister alone, thankfully. Well, sort of. She wants Shepard to grant her access to the Alliance's resources to help with the tracking, and then brags about how she always has a plan as she heads out the door. That sounds about right for Miranda. To her credit, she does realize that she wanted to plant a control chip in Shepard when they were rebuilding him, which is exactly the type of thing that her father would kill for in order to control her. So I guess there's some character development there, which I'm slightly above lukewarm about. Uh, lukewarm plus. Anyways, the Asari counselor here is like, all right, fine. The Asari are gonna help everyone stave off total annihilation, I guess. This help comes in the form of a top secret artifact that is said to have the power to upset the balance of the galaxy if it falls into the wrong hands. The counselor tells Shepard about it now, since it may have the power to locate the final component of the Crucible. Also, their home planet is under attack. I guess you hold the cards you got until the last moment, I don't know. So we fly in with Liara and get greeted with our old friend, the turret section. I just like how we land and it's like, Oh, thank God you're here, Commander Shepard. No one else knows how to work this thing. The Asari here are fighting their best, but it's almost like their entire people were created by the devs with a single trait at this stage. That they use biotics. Like, nearly every cutscene has an Asari soldier using the Force to move around shit like there was a quota to fulfill. I mean, yeah, they're the most powerful race when it comes to biotics, but what happened to that concept of biotic artillery with the Jack mission? It just seems like these guys playing Tetris with the rubble was like the least interesting display of these powers that they could come up with. 
Either way, we find our way to the temple where this artifact is hidden, and we get the opportunity to learn a little more about the Asari people's origins. Basically, the Asari have always worshipped a goddess named Athame. Well, I mean, a much smaller group of Asari do nowadays. But in all of the murals, busts, statues, and scriptures, there are obvious implications that Athame was just a Prothean who presented themselves as a goddess. The issue with this discovery is that the dialogue does not feel fluid at all, as every single bit of speech has Shepard asking Liara what the artifact they're standing in front of means. And Liara answers by stating that the artifact isn't very useful. Then Garrus points out that the artifacts look and sound like Protheans who manipulated the early Asari people into serving them. And Liara responds with, Oh, good golly gosh, but I just wouldn't know what to do with all of those implications. Which, uh, okay. So Javik was DLC, meaning that he was inserted into the game after its initial release. But Bioware didn't go back into this vanilla scene to reconfigure Liara's knowledge and attitude involving everything that she learned from Javik's existence which makes all of these talks all the more frustrating on top of the repeated dialogue. Now, to their credit, I did reload the mission and bring along Javik instead, and the dialogue here is much better since he straight up tells Liara that his people taught her people everything that they knew, even utilizing years of genetic research to figure out how to draw out their biotic powers. Liara still seems very put off by the info, but I guess that can be chalked up to her people's goddess turning out to be a Prothean at least, instead of her attitude solely being derived by the mere concept of Protheans intervening in Asari evolution. At least, that's the way I was hoping this conversation would go now, but no, not really. When we approach the statue of Athame, Liara goes, Yeah, I don't believe all this Prothean shit. We definitely had a cool-ass goddess. How the hell did we go from you being a super intellectually competent archaeologist turned shadow broker to a borderline flat earther who straight up denies evidence that makes complete sense? I mean, yeah, okay, it's hard to suddenly have your belief system turned upside down, but even she states that most Asari don't really believe in a Athame anymore. Whatever. The reason this thing was such a state secret is because there's a Prothean artifact hidden away in the statue of a Athame which implies that the Asari people have been widely considered to be the most advanced of the alien races because they've been hoarding Prothean knowledge to get their own race ahead of the others, which is also against the Council rules, and I imagine that they made up that rule so that they could get more Prothean knowledge. Liara continues to deny this accusation, getting very defensive about her people, which I actually don't really agree with from a writing angle. Throughout these games, she's always been pretty level-headed and willing to see the truths that other people wanted to keep secret. But now that it's her people that have done something not so great, despite putting on the airs that they're these cooperators who mingle with other races all of the time, she's closing her eyes as hard as she can and pretending that the evidence in front of her doesn't exist. It's a strange twist for her character, and it really only points at the idea that she's a hypocrite, or that the writers just thought that it would be a good idea for her to be in denial. Anyways, these guys walked into the temple, saw two Asari scientists with their throats slit, and went, huh, that's weird. And then they continued to look for how to get this extraordinarily powerful artifact free from the goddess statue. Like, it didn't even cross their minds to search the place for an assassin. But whatever, we get the statue to crumble, extract the Prothean VI nougat inside, and ask it a bunch of questions that are unknown to it, but are answered in the Leviathan DLC. There is still one small note of interest, though. The reason for the Crucible not being completed in the Protheans' timeline. And the answer was that there was a splinter group of Protheans who believed that the Reapers should be dominated and controlled, rather than destroyed. Which sounds very familiar with how Cerberus has been operating. Turns out that that splinter group that wanted to control the Reapers were indoctrinated, hinting at what's going on with the Elusive Man. Well, here comes Kylo Ren to ruin another form of media, Basically, he comes in, places down an elusive man pokeball, the elusive man pops out and denies being controlled by the Reapers, and then orders his ninja to get the data. We engage the guy in a fight where he just restores his health repeatedly while his gunship rains hellfire down on us. Eventually, Ninja Man throws Liara into Javik, and they're both incapacitated for two whole minutes. Shepard gets tossed into a chasm, and Lo Wang grabs the VI data and saunters out at a pace that can only be described as walking through a park with zero Reapers attacking or buildings crumbling. Liara saves Shepard, Shepard shoots his gun at the gunship, all is lost. This scene is fucking stupid. 
And I'm not mad that we lost here, I'm mad at the amount of times that we've interacted with this shoehorned in enemy. It's been two times. The first time he kills Thane with no one interfering. The second he just knocks everyone out and takes the artifact. The consequences in this game and its series are at their best when people as heroic as the Normandy's crew are thrown against insurmountable odds. Against a threat that they can hardly comprehend the magnitude of. When you put in a literal cyborg ninja and he just wipes the floor with them because he's so cool, it just it cheapens every massive set piece of this series. Let's say Scorpion here shows up in the middle of the Tuchanka fight. If that happens, we lose it. Krogans aren't cured. Say he shows up during the Geth War. The Aquarians are wiped out, the Geth continue to fight for the Reapers. The implication that this one guy is the antithesis to the heroics that Shepard and his crew constantly pull off only weakens these moments of glory. And I can see why the devs wanted a singular entity that could fight like Shepard but was still working against him. But the way that all of this was handled is atrocious. For as much insight that Bioware has had regarding the overall plot of this series, and the roles that the races and characters within it would play, they should have known better than to stick some random guy in at the last moment. And I don't care if there was a big reveal and it turns out that they brought back Saren's soul and stuck him into this ninja's body. I mean, hell, even that would be really stupid. But what I'm saying is that if they wanted to have this villain suddenly appear, they needed to bring him up at least in the first or second game. Maybe he starts as a good guy, and he gets pulled into the idea that Cerberus is doing the right thing. Maybe he feels betrayal at the idea of Shepard leaving Cerberus after all that they have been through. Shepard should have been able to recognize this person on sight. And yeah, it would have been pretty anime, but it would have also had enough background attached to it that it didn't really matter as much as it does now. The funny part is that there was a shitload of information about Kai Lang in the Mass Effect Foundation comics, which were released... Uh, a year and a half after Mass Effect 3. So that should probably tell you that this guy was not a well thought out addition to the series. As always, the strong suit here does shine through as the Asari home planet is ravaged and all seems lost. It is something that these guys have always been really good at, so at least the emotional impact isn't completely lost here. When we make it back to the ship, it turns out that Trainer has tracked Kai Leng to a system where war refugees typically go to reside, and that all tracking was blocked after that. And weirdly enough, this is the start of the endgame. I won't say too much more about the events that we just powered through, but I will say that Javik did feel like the right choice for this last mission overall. Though I would also say that bringing him as a double-edged sword, as Liara's denial of the Protheans' involvement in her people's evolution becomes a lot sillier when Javik is right there telling her the facts. Still, putting aside that detail, it felt a lot better hearing these events straight from the horse's mouth rather than the usual speculation that this scene tosses out there. Before we engage in the endgame antics, there are a couple of side events which we have to run through which range from pretty petty to extremely impactful. Starting on the low end of things, Kai Lang literally writes you an email that starts with, Good, you open this. And then goes on to detail how badass he is and how weak Shepard is. Good job, Bioware. Surely this will make up for interacting with this guy two whole times before this. Joker, on the other hand, makes a casual wisecrack about the Asari needing to train less dancers and more commandos. Which, uh, Shepard takes offense to. Shocking. Of course, Joker manages to turn Shep's anger against him by yelling out that Anderson told Joker to take care of him and that Joker's dad and sister probably died two weeks ago in a Reaper attack. So I guess that makes the joke a better one. I do like this interaction though, as it showcases a mistake that Joker made when trying to make things right. And it leads to an understanding between these two that hadn't been established before. This understanding continues between several other crew members of the ship as we're now witnessing a lump of self-doubt that Shepard has never really shown before. As much as I've never really talked too much about Shepard's personality, I realize now that he's never needed to have an extraordinarily groundbreaking persona. He's confident, supportive, charismatic, heroic. I mean, depending on if you choose a bunch of renegade actions, he could be a bunch of other things too. But all of those don't really define who someone is when talking casually. And he doesn't need that definition. The definition that he needs to be is a vessel for the player. One that doesn't stray too much further than, am I playing good guy Paragon Shep or bad boy Renegade Shep? So this doubt is fine when it's surface level like this. And his crew who he's grown close to over the course of these games are here to pick him up and set him right. 
I like it because it doesn't go overboard. It just helps to push this idea that the weight of the galaxy is on his shoulders all the more. Liara, on the other hand, is a mess, as she has the right to be. I really can't judge her the same way that I did before when she was experiencing a wave of denial, because this is just grief, which he's now taking out on Javik for being the straight-faced Prothean that he's always been. Though he probably deserves a bit of a verbal thrashing, his character has remained true to who he is and needs to be to continue on, and Liara isn't happy about that. He does eventually state bluntly as always that his people saw the wisdom of the Asari long before they had fully evolved, which is the reason why they were elevated the way that they were. This seems to calm Liara down, and the two leave it at that for now. So did you actually mean what you said? Does it matter? Liara's been a good friend to me. It matters. Then I will tell you what you want to hear. I meant what I said. This results in Liara heading back to her quarters to cry and blame herself, which you can step in to help her with. As wobbly as this denial into grief into sorrow started, it does end well for Liara's character. She's tougher now, but that brief window into who and how she used to be is an important one. One that shows that a lot of her current character as the Shadow Broker is a mix of genuine and a facade. Shepard lifts her back up briefly by reminding her inadvertently that he's gone through the exact same thing, and that she can still help in even the smallest ways. But this is the state of the Normandy as of right now. Things are dire at their worst possible moments, and it feels dramatic. It's heartfelt and emotional. But I still can't help but sit here and think that everyone's sulking because a fucking space ninja stole our Prothean Tamagotchi. I mean, yes, it's the biggest loss that we've experienced since the start of this game, especially considering what happened to the Asari home planet, but that destruction feels like a byproduct compared to the real reason for Shepard sulking. I don't know. Sanctuary is a supposed safe haven for war refugees. You think it's worth checking out, trainer? There is actually one small humorous note that I want to kind of break this up with, and that's Caden's pronunciation of things. I haven't caught any more than these two back-to-back -back words, but for some reason they both made the cut for the final version of this game. The first one is the System of Iera, which Caden just calls Lara, with a lowercase l. I was stationed on Horizon in the Lara system. The second is Kai Lang, who he calls Kai Lang. And don't worry about Kai Lang. Now that we've seen his dirty moves, next time, He's getting his ass kicked. I don't know, I just thought that this was funny and have to wonder if it was the voice actor's fault or if it was intentional. Though digging up an old audio blog in which the voice actor acts out a message to Shepard has him pronouncing Ilos as Elos and Vermeer as Vermeer. So I'm guessing it was the former. I mean, do you, do you even remember that night before Elos? I mean, I've watched too many close people to me die. On Eden Prime, on Vermeer. So there's one more minor thing that we get to take on before hitting the real shit, which is one last Cerberus mission where it turns out that they're attacking a communications facility this time. I mean, they just stole the key to winning this war, but yeah, sure, chuck this one in there too. Just seems like a weird bit of structuring from Bioware. Anyways, I feel like I've done a decent job of describing what Cerberus side missions look like, but I need you to fully comprehend the magnitude of what these things encompass since this is the last one. Cerberus has taken one of our secret communication facilities. Misato, what's happening down there? I'm staying in, but I'm the only one left. They're trying to hack into our systems to access Alliance operations protocols. I've avoided really doing any more than covering them until this moment, but nearly all of these extracurricular quests are garbage. They don't do anything enriching for this game, and they only serve to pad it with content that adds maybe one to two hours of playtime max. I know this whole structure has kind of been a trend with Mass Effect games, but how hard would it have been to have little optional decisions that affect your war asset outcome? You go to extract some data, but midway through it you have to choose between the data and some colonists. 
You secure a set of anti-air guns, but you have to choose whether or not to strip them down for crucible parts or to use them to keep this theater of war safe. Little things like that wouldn't have been remarkably game-changing, but they still would have made a difference for second playthroughs. Either way, let's get to the two major bits of gameplay before the ending missions. We'll start with the Leviathan DLC, which I completed earlier. If you'll recall, a doctor on the Citadel was researching the history of the Reapers, where they came from, why they're doing what they're doing, and so on. During this doctor's research, he stumbled upon something known as the Leviathan, which supposedly killed a Reaper in battle. The Dead Reaper was discovered by the Batarians, who began salvaging it while covering up its existence. And the Doctor who were meeting wound up sending out one of his assistants to check on the Leviathan's last known location in an attempt to gain an edge on the Reapers. Before the Doctor can give us the full scope of the information, though, he's shot by another assistant who was indoctrinated for a brief moment. I don't quite understand why the writers like to skirt the idea that Shepard could point towards indoctrination as a cause when they don't feel like revealing it, and instead opt for Shepard going through this whole song and dance of, hey, what's wrong with you? You shot a man. He's dead. Why did you do this? I mean, it's very obvious that the guy was indoctrinated. And even if that isn't what happened, you'd think that Shepard would go, hmm, it kind of seems like this guy's had his mind affected by the Reapers. But they were among the elusive man's top scientists. They could help build the Crucible. Unless they're indoctrinated, and this is a ruse to get Cerberus close to the Crucible. Instead, he has the murderer escorted away by c -Sec and begins the process of searching the doctor's lab for clues as to where his assistant might have gone. After discovering which system the guy's in, we show up at a mining facility with indoctrinated forces trying to bust down the doors. This looks like a job for me pressing the 4 key and the 1 key repeatedly. Huh. Noted. After adjusting to the current threat, we get into the facility and expect to see people panicking and cowering. Instead, we get this. I'm Commander Shepard of the Alliance. You just had Reaper troops attacking your front door. Are they still there? I've taken care of them for now. I see. That will be all. Yes. Welcome to TGS Mineral Works. How can we help you? You don't seem worried about those Reapers. You know something I don't? TGS Mineral Works is a small to mid-level supplier of tungsten to the galaxy. That's not what I meant. Again, the idea that they're somehow being controlled doesn't even cross the crew's minds as a possibility, which is so strange to me. I mean, yeah, they're probably not indoctrinated by the Reapers, seeing as the Reaper forces were bearing down on them, but we know next to nothing about the Leviathan, so you'd think that this would be the next logical conclusion. From here, though, the mission is well done in some regards and not so well done in others. Pushing further in has us encountering a bunch of workers who stand around and stare at you as you navigate through their workspace. They all tell you that you shouldn't be here, but don't perform any hostile actions towards you. There are various doors and systems which won't let you in without certain ID numbers or codes. A video which starts playing a generic message about the mining facility before cutting to a live feed of Shepard, and an overall creepy vibe to this whole place. But a little of that atmosphere is ruined when you can't get through certain doors, but can hack through other doors to get further into the area. It feels strange being restricted from entering a room that contains a crew quarters and not much else, but then you can bypass the doors which lead closer to where our guy is being held. Regardless, you do need to grab some codes and to cycle through the security system in order to progress through to the final door where this assistant is supposed to be. When you get to him, it turns out that, yeah, the Leviathan has its own indoctrination powers, which it's been using to keep this station under control. The assistant winds up bolting, which places us in some of the most intense combat that I've seen out of these games. Enemies are dangerous, swarming, and good at taking hits. The final bout of combat has us escorting a drone, which keeps me in its bubble to keep it repairing, causing me to have to switch tactics from the usual slam and jam that I've been brandishing until now. It's a tough fight, but it felt pretty good, even with the escort. Hell, I'd argue that the escort made it the way that it is. Well, shit. The end result has us cornering the Leviathan-controlled corpse, which is being swarmed by Reaper-controlled husks. At the guy's back is an artifact which mirrors one that was sitting in the doctor's lab back on the Citadel. 
Of course, every time a character needs a way out in one of these games, they suddenly have a detonator with 200 pounds of C4 attached to it. So he blows himself up along with the husks and the artifact. Afterwards, we find the actual corpse of the guy that we came here to find, and the miners regain their senses after being controlled for 10 years. Well, okay, so either one of two things is happening here. Either they were controlled for a small amount of time and their memories of the last 10 years were wiped, or they were indoctrinated for 10 years. As much as I hate to fill the blanks in for a dev, the former makes a lot more sense, all things considered. If Leviathan was controlling these people for 10 years, it would also need to keep them fed and watered. Additionally, these guys were definitely not being productive in a mining capacity. If they stopped producing their quota, some higher-ups would definitely call or check in, which would lead to more indoctrination. I'm not saying it's an impossible situation, but without indoctrinating the higher-ups too over the course of 10 years of lesser production, I'd imagine that any human with a brain would notice the strange behavior and lack of profit radiating from this outfit. Either way, now that the point has been driven into a realm where it can't possibly be questioned by anyone with an IQ above 40, Shepard and the gang now understand that everyone here was controlled by Leviathan. I just hate that the writing has to dumb down its characters so much as to not reveal the big twist. With this new information, Shep realizes that the Reapers are attracted to these dark orbs, and are trying to either take or destroy them, as they backed off as soon as the orb was dismantled. Which means that the one that's sitting on the Citadel is Bad News Bears. Fortunately, our scientist man figured out a way to shield the artifact from sending out signals before he biffed it. So we just hammer a button in the lab to make the shield happen. Then we do some more digging to figure out where the original Doctor's daughter went off to, as she was on the Leviathan case as well. The second verse of this DLC is more direct, as the Doctor's daughter Anne is currently under attack by the Reapers. This level has us following the path as it crumbles and falls and creates alternate routes. It really makes me think that all of this would have felt a lot better with a controller. Regardless, we make it to her, there's an orb, the orb seizes control of her for a moment, we shatter it, and then we peace out with her. It's very simple, but I guess it doesn't really overstay its welcome either. At this stage, we're figuring that the Leviathan was probably a Reaper who betrayed its own kind, but obviously no one really knows for sure yet. That writing is a bit weird, since the crew looks at this ancient crayon drawing and goes, ah, yes, look, that must be what the Leviathan actually is which is not the first conclusion that I would jump to at all. So we go from, oh gee whiz, these people sure are being strange right now, to, yeah, that's Leviathan. It was a Reaper. Anyone with a brain could see that. So back at the lab, we determined the best way to pinpoint Leviathan is to let the artifact here take over Anne's body and trace the signal back to where it's being broadcast from. Thankfully, James is here to hold Anne down while we talk to Leviathan and try to get it to fight on our side. There's a point where she starts to become more erratic in her movements and James goes to cut the signal. You can stop him with a renegade action to further narrow down the signal tracking, which leads to her nose bleeding. I had the option to narrow down the search even further, but it was looking pretty bad, so I let James cut the transmission. Anne then tells Shepard that Leviathan seems like it wants to kill him, which we wouldn't have actually been told if we stopped James from cutting the signal a second time, so that's kinda neat. The final mission is by far the coolest in terms of setting, feeling, and just pure fun. These guys really nailed this one, as the Leviathan fits its name by existing on a planet made up entirely of oceans. There are some remnants of a few floating barges here, so we have a place to touch down when a pulse of energy fries our systems when we're forced to make a crash landing. Exploring this stormy husk of a barge has us thumbing through the logs of what happened to the previous group here. They also couldn't get their ships working to leave, and were stranded in this hostile environment with no edible food that they could find. They eventually went crazy due to the artifacts all over the place here before resorting to cannibalism and dying off. At this point, the Reapers have caught up, but won't come any further down from the atmosphere because they're afraid of being disabled by the pulses sent out by Leviathan who resides deep in the ocean. So they instead send down waves of enemies, causing us to resort to patching up a diving suit mech while fighting them off. This whole situation is appropriately terrifying, and it's crazy how even though we've been on a suicide mission in the middle of a galaxy, I'm still sitting here like, Jesus Christ, Shep, you sure about this one? But I guess that just further enhances how heroic Shepard is for as goofy as he can be sometimes. And so we drop 3,000 meters into the dark ocean, and good God, what an amazingly immersive experience. 
You're not coming down here and Star Fox shooting at the jellyfish and other life. You can't fire your guns, the flares are shot automatically, the whole thing is in first person, and you can only walk. Which sounds like pretty shitty gameplay, right? I mean, it's a walking sim at this stage. But it's done so well and is so different from the Gears of War combat that we've gotten before this that it feels like it belongs. When you make it to the end, Leviathan rises up from the ocean. Not a reaper, but the gigantic sea monster that you probably expected at this stage. It claims that it's been here since before the Reapers, and that it's been fighting against them killing it off for many, many years. Then it takes on the form of Anne and the various other humans that it possessed in Shepard's mind to better converse with him. And here's where everything is laid out plainly. The Leviathans were at the very top of the food chain many, many millennia ago. Other races looked up to them, provided them with tribute like sea gods and the like. In return, the Leviathans looked down on the other organics as tools to be used, forcing themselves into their minds and using them to develop space travel for some reason. I guess to harvest resources for them to use. But during this time, it was discovered that the land-based organics would consistently build inorganic tools laced with artificial intelligence which would inevitably give way to robot uprisings. This happened so many times that the Leviathans literally had to build their own AI with the express intent of keeping their beloved organic tools alive. Like honest to god, organics were so consistently stupid about creating AI and having it turn on them, that their gods decided to build them a handler so that they didn't kill themselves. But it gets even better. So the Leviathan said, wow, you guys are stupid. This is how it's done. And then their own AI turned against them because it decided that the Leviathans were the reason why any of this was happening in the first place? I swear to god if this explanation didn't have the dramatic tones that it had, they could have easily substituted wacky clown music and made this into a comedy routine. I don't know what wacky clown music sounds like, but you know, some kind of juggling music. The rogue AI went on to take this whole idea of preserving life literally and began utilizing various races as pawns to collect as much genetic material as possible. Then they used that material to create the very first Reaper, which then went on to start the whole harvesting cycle. Races would be cultivated, their growth expedited by the Citadel and the mass relays which were lying around. And then the Reapers would kill them all, harvest their DNA, and build a new Reaper. All in the name of quite literally preserving life. Holy shit. And at the end of the day, what did the Leviathans do? They went, oh shit, wow, we really fucked this one up, huh? I guess we'll just uh, erase all evidence of our existence and chug that one up to an L. Then they basically spent their time watching space TV through their magic orbs that they scattered around the galaxy. I mean, yeah, sure, I'm definitely painting this as a more humorous situation, but that's literally how it all went down, more or less. Honestly, it's kind of a cool story. Uh, it's a little silly, but I mean, it's not bad. With the Q&A session done, Shepard now beseeches these monsters to actually get off of their asses and fight their own creations. They're like, nah, I don't wanna. And Shepard calls them big underwater tentacle pussies. So they're like, alright, fine. I don't know how they'll impact the fight, but I imagine they'll be taking over a chunk of the Reaper forces through their mind control or something, which is showcased right after this when Shepard jetpacks to the surface. Ultimately, the Leviathan DLC is really damn cool. The actual mystery revolving around the Leviathans, in addition to how they corrupt people much in the same way that the Reapers do, made for a fun detective case. The combat sections in the first and last missions were actually pretty fun. I think about as fun as this type of combat system can feasibly pump out, which is ironic because it didn't seem to have a lot of those action game gimmicks that a lot of the other missions seem to take on. The finale of this DLC was so well done from the gloomy atmosphere of the planet to the need to dive into the water to the big reveal that I was impressed even existed in this game. The final answer does make sense, even if it can be spun into a comedy routine and I dig how it all panned out. But all of that said, I do have a few gripes with the writing in a couple of realms. Firstly, the whole, golly, these people sure are weird, was really silly and should have at least been revised to have these guys have a minor clue as to what was going on even if they didn't have the full picture yet. It kind of undermines the natural intelligence and experience which Javik brings to the table when not even he latches onto the idea until it's right in front of his eyes. And secondly, this DLC is a little problematic in the grander scheme of things. I mean, let's get this straight. 
The Reapers are an overwhelming, crushing force of destruction that a single mind can barely comprehend. They're smarter, stronger, and less emotionally driven than any species that they're up against. And instead of attacking the Citadel immediately, which is the seat of the government that rules over the galaxy, they just ignore it until the end of the game. This is despite the fact that they were so much more tactical when they pile-drove the Protheans into dust. When Javik regales what happened to his people, he claims that the Reapers intentionally cut off the head of the snake to cause the Prothean Empire to fall into disarray faster when they began their onslaught. So setting that aside, let's say that the Reapers are confident that these new races are more inept than the Protheans. Which, I mean, is partially true. Let's pretend that they harbor no respect for the likes of Shepard, who literally foiled their plans to invade multiple times. Let's say that they're now just going to overwhelm planet after planet instead of rushing past them to attack the Citadel first because, hey, they have information-era giant death robots and Gandhi over here is still rocking ancient-era archer units. Fine. But the Leviathan DLC adds yet another layer of purpose for the Reapers to attack the Citadel immediately. Seeing as these guys have had this orb that the Reapers are attracted to because it could lead them to the Leviathans to finish what they started. And yet they prolong the attack by squabbling with humans, Turians, Asari, and so on because I guess that makes for a better story and gives the Organics yet another fighting chance. I guess I'm just not a huge fan of the Reapers suddenly figuring, well, I guess we've got this, nothing can stop us. Either way, let's turn the page here and cut over to our last bit of miscellaneous stuff before we take on the ending. So at the end of the Shore Leave DLC, you get to plan a party. I dipped out of this because I wanted Tally here for it. So let's get back to that chunk of content. So our goal on the Silver Sun Strip is to purchase some party supplies. But it becomes clear that there's a lot more to this place than furniture and party supply shopping. The most immediate thing to do would be to participate in the arena, which you can fight in to try to rack up the most points in three rounds of combat. Depending on how quickly you kill your enemies, you'll be awarded with a gold, silver, or bronze token, which you can then trade in for more challenges, allies, and arenas. Basically, it's a big old time sink, but one that I didn't really feel pressured to do for too long. And it really isn't done too badly at all. You can buy licenses to bring in some squad members from the older games, accept challenges which have you fighting tougher enemies or with certain handicaps, and earn reputation points by meeting certain conditions. I enjoy it for what it's worth and I think it's a fun addition to the strip. Jack also shows up at one point and you can participate in a half round with her as your only companion, which is her way of blowing off steam. Next up we have the arcade. Zaid is here losing his fucking mind at the claw machine. You're mine, you bastard. God damn it. Over here, Shepard. This thing is fucking impossible. It's obviously rigged somehow. Rigged? I'm going to hunt down the shit for brains inventor of this crooked game and pull his inspiration out through his asshole. Probably some smart ass Salarian bastard. I'm going back in. Credits. Trainer is here participating in a space chess tournament, which is packed with all of the humor that the rest of this DLC brings to the table. Would you like to just give me your frigates now? I always take them sooner or later. Polgara to Sousa. She's knocked me out of four tournaments. Specialist? Commander? Kick her ass. Roger that. I'd expect the great thinkers to be helping with the Asari war effort. I mean, Earth was taken by surprise, but Nessia? You had all the warning in the world, and the Reapers just rolled in. Excuse me, I'm trying to play. You're trash-talking. That's another strategy that doesn't work on the Reapers. It didn't work on the Rachni either, or the Krobin. Have the Asari ever won a war? That's gonna be one of my favorite Renegade lines across the series. In terms of the actual games that you can play in the arcade, you can take over Claw Duty from Zaid for the chance at new music for Shepard's apartment and a couple of weapon mods. You can also play a simple fighting game in which you can attack or defend, and a planet defense game where you can send ships to a Mass Effect relay while shooting down enemy ships. These games are okay at best, but the fact that they're here is still a fun idea even if they're not incredible to play. I did like the Towers of Hanoi reference, which is that stupid little puzzle that's been in a few Bioware games like Jade Empire, Mass Effect 1, and KOTOR. Jacob is also kicking around here, and he tries to impress some kids that he's looking after by trash-talking Shep before a round of the fighting game. 
When you beat his ass, he laments the fact that you didn't let him win. Now, Shepard, I'll try not to embarrass you. Really? Trash talk? A shattered Ezo? Well, step up, Shepard. Although it might be tough not having your squad to carry you. No pressure, Shepard. These people already idolized you. So when you choke, it won't matter. You're crowding me. Am I? My bad. Stand back, everyone. Shepard needs extra room to make the magic happen. Nice one. Okay, okay. You couldn't just let me win just once? And lastly, we have the casino, which is functionally the same area that it was during the infiltration mission. But it does have one small addition, which involves a scene where we try to get Garrus laid by the second female Turian that we've seen in the series. I saw you checking out my friend here. I thought you two should meet. Hello? Right. So, um, hmm. Hello, and, hmm, you seem like a nice person. Maybe a little quiet, introspective, but decent, overall. Oh, thank you, I think. Try small talk. Come here often. I imagine anyone who does is probably an alcoholic. Actually, I do. I work at the Turian Embassy. I'm here to unwind. Holy fucking shit. My brother in Christ just, wow. All right, uh, well, fortunately, Grunt is also here. Anything you want to tell me about? Uh, this clown wants to take me to lockup. Figured I'd give you a call, straighten this out. What happened? I don't know. Drank a bit, left the hospital, broke a few windows. Tell me about the windows. A couple of squad mates broke me out for my birthday, tried lowering me down the side of the building on a rope. It didn't work out. When CSEC got there, they were mad. Or maybe they were mad about their car being on fire. I can't remember. Why was it on fire? I threw my bottle of ring call at it. Pretty strong stuff. It went up like a bonfire. Then I figured they didn't want it, so I took it. We didn't get very far before they shut us down. So how did they catch you? Got hungry, bought some noodles. And that's why Krogans are the best thing to happen to this series. Javik is here as well, although his meetup has you participating in the filming of a B-tier action movie, which goes about as well as you would think. I think you're just a big, stupid jellyfish. The last thing that we can do here before kicking off the party is inviting several people up to the apartment to hang out. In my case, I can invite Edie, Thane's son, and Tally. With Edie, we wind up shopping for presents for the crew, with Joker being the first purchase, followed by a ring for Shepard. It's a cute scene, and it makes me wish that I could have hung out with the entire crew this way. Now, on the exact polar opposite end of this emotional spectrum is Thane's son, which has us inviting him up for a funeral for Thane. It's a complete bummer, but a really heartfelt and touching moment regardless. Many of the people who knew Thane gave a small speech about him, including his son and Shepard. Afterwards, Thane's son gives us some videos which Thane tried to send Shep, but they never actually made it through to him. While Thane was hopeful that Shepard would reply to his messages, he realizes that they may not make it through due to his status as an assassin. The videos themselves aren't anything beyond small updates about how Thane had been getting on, but they're the last words that you'll hear out of him, which makes their insignificance shrink. And lastly, Tally involves a date night, as you might expect. I'm as free as the dust in the solar wind. Yeah, that's great, Tally. I'm trying to watch cartoons here. Oh, we can activate sing-along mode. Let the moon shining light hide to lovers Sally, I've never watched this movie. Do I... Do I sing also? Oh, you're still going. Uh, do, 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 I don't think this is a duet. Works for me. What is with your elbows? They're so soft. What the hell is this fabric? All right, let's do the party thing. This is, uh... If I described every single conversation between every group during every phase of this party, we would probably go on for another half hour, hour, there is a lot more to this than I thought there'd be. 
and the choice between having a mellow and classy party or an energetic and wild party also affects the conversations between the various groups that can mingle. I had planned on running through each party theme to see what I could get out of each side, but uh, hadn't really anticipated this long of an ordeal. Looking it up, it appears that only the first and third bit of the partying is affected by the theme, but not the second bit. Basically, your task here is to mingle, listening to various conversations which range from tamer stuff like Trainer asking about what it was like to be a veteran aboard the Normandy, to wilder stuff like Zaid wanting to know which of the two Krogans are stronger. Edie asks Trainer why she was so turned on by her voice. James argues with all of the Biotics users about physical conditioning being better than Biotics. Three people start shooting at bottles. Tally gets drunk as hell immediately. So he won't dance with you, huh? Hello, Shepard. You will not. See you. Well, I will. <laughs> it's actually probably one of my favorite bits in these games, especially with this being the only time that you really see the people that you've met across them this way. As the party winds down, most people turn to dancing. Kasumi raids Shepard's underwear drawer, and Grunt passes out in the shower. Now that's a hell of a party. When all is said and done, a group picture is taken, and Shepard wakes up next to the person that he's closest to. Everyone is in various states of after-party hangover or hang under. This whole scene represents everyone's personalities perfectly, and when it's time to ship out, it feels like the developers were saying goodbye to this trilogy. It's a great send-off, and it rounds out this collection of DLC perfectly. I'll say this again, if every batch of DLC was as great as Mass Effect 3's, I'd have no worries playing through them. It's an extraordinarily rare moment when the only thing that I can dock a season pass on is half a DLC and when you can gain access to them. But even with the fact that I can do these DLCs sooner than they arguably should be done, I also understand the devs wanting to let people access their purchase as soon as possible. I keep saying, alright, one more thing, because that's how a lot of this stuff has been structured. But I mean shit, there really does seem to be just one more thing repeatedly, and that's usually a good thing. But in this case, you can hang out and invite pretty much everyone else who didn't pop by before, which seems more like filler than actual thought out content. James comes over to show off his tattoo and then becomes absolutely enamored by a punching bag in one of the rooms. You can choose to do pull-ups, which has you alternating between Renegade and Paragon checks. James claims that his record is 182, which you can try to beat for some reason. I thought this game would do some time skips, but um, no, you just do pull-ups until 183, which is more of a bragging rights thing than it actually having any effect. I don't think I've ever felt this accomplished and slighted at the exact same time, but it does fit James's character. Inviting Caden up has him cooking Shepard dinner, which is... The dialogue is almost uncomfortable because it doesn't feel like Shepard's just giving Caden shit. It feels like he genuinely dislikes Caden. We're heading out, Caden. I'm so tired of Apollos. I'm gonna cook. Oh, no. Really? <laughs> Come on! You want me to sit there and watch you cook? Wish me luck. If you need luck to cook us dinner, we're screwed. So, remember how I saved the Citadel? And then, well, you weren't there. I survived a suicide mission? All these close calls I've had, only to be taken out by dinner. Can it at least be quick and painless? I was great. Still waiting for the botulism to kick in. It just... It feels like these two have zero chemistry without being romantically involved with one another. At least I don't gotta cook 183 steaks after. Liara drops by and plays a 20th of a song on the piano, talks about what it means to her, and then tries to dip before Shepard asks her to teach it to him. Which, I mean, it's cute in a way, but again, without the romantic connection, I feel like a lot of these characters just kind of fall flat. I think I'd have less of an issue if the two went and actually did something, or there was some sort of time lapse that showed Liara teaching Shep the song or whatever. Miranda drops by and asks about the clone business, which is boring. I feel like all of this stuff was more of an afterthought, where it was fun and interesting with the initial guests of Edie, Thane's son, and Tally. These guys were just added at this stage because, I mean, might as well, right? 
it just kind of sours the good note that the DLC seemed to conclude on. You can invite Trainer up who literally takes a bath in your hot tub while you stand around the corner and shout at her for conversational purposes. Dude, this girl wanted to meet you for lunch, forgot about the lunch, and entered a space chess tournament. And then she messaged you and said, Oh my god, I'm sorry about forgetting our lunch plans. Do you want to invite me up to your apartment? And then she just takes a bath and leaves. Jack drops by with her new Varen pet, which is probably the best of these interactions since it's short and sweet. Samara pops in to watch people and make up stories about their lives, which was also not so bad. And you can go out to the casino with Miranda and oh my god, look at her fucking fingers! Truth is, Shepard, I'm not very good at being normal either. Bit of a disaster, really. Anyways, the reason why this is all here is because if you've noticed, these are all romanceable characters. So this would be your opportunity if you've expressed interest slash are the right Shep for the job. And I imagine that these scenes would be better if that were the case. But as a male Shep who's already with Tally, these cutscenes are a lot more dull and probably would have had a lot more impact and interest between Shepard and the person that he invited up had they been romantically charged. Alright, it's time. Heading into Sanctuary reveals that there's been some infighting between the Reapers and Cerberus, with both sides seeing casualties. Miranda's here somewhere, and she's left a recording behind stating that Sanctuary was in place to lure refugees to it in order to experiment on them. These experiments saw Cerberus doing average, normal shit like turning refugees into husks, which is a great start. Also, yeah, Miranda's sister is here and the facility is owned by the sibling's crazy-ass father. Pressing further in reveals the source of the infighting. Cerberus wasn't just creating Reaper forces willy-nilly, they were also trying to figure out a way to control the Reapers. Obviously, the Reapers weren't happy when they made a breakthrough, hence the attack. We get to the end, Kai Lang wins again, Miranda's father has taken her sister hostage, Miranda throws him out the window and gives you data on a tracer that she planted on Kai Lang. I know that was quick, but I really don't have time to care about Miranda suddenly, no matter how dramatic they try to make it. Alright, take her. But I want out alive. Deal? No deal. Oh, what a one-liner! Oh, she said no deal! Ah! After this foray, it turns out that Tally has taken this whole situation pretty hard, getting blasted again at the bar on the Normandy. How are you getting drunk? Very carefully. Torian brandy, triple filtered, then introduced into the suit through an emergency induction port. That's a straw, Tally. Emergency induction port. Yeah, this whole situation reminds her of the relationship that her and her father had, and how she did everything to both please him and clean up his messes, which is an interesting character tie-in that I honestly wouldn't have thought to include. So props to the writers there. Alright, so we can use this tracking info to figure out where the elusive man has been hiding all this time. Every part of the Crucible has been completed besides the final component, which is called the Catalyst and we're getting to that point of no return. Tally comes in for a romance scene which results in Shepard battling his PTSD dreams again. I never mentioned this until now just because it was easier to talk about all in one place, but Shepard's been having horrible nightmares of the Snake Boy from Earth ever since he left. I get why the writers wanted to have these moments of trauma haunting Shepard, much like they wanted to show him beating himself up after losing to Kai Lang. But when he has a nightmare in like the first 30 minutes of the game, it feels a little forced, especially since he's never had stuff like this happen to him in the other games. Now, while I did kind of roll my eyes at these nightmares the first couple of times, I do have to admit that they feel a lot more appropriate now that the final battle is dawning. And I also think that the last dream wouldn't have had as much impact if those former dreams weren't there. The addition of Morden's voice, Legion's voice, and so on really helped display those feelings of remorse and weakness that any human would be feeling in Shepard's shoes. The second to last mission in this game is a mandatory Edie mission. I mean, it makes complete sense with her being able to best assess Cerberus' systems and help out with the assault, but I guess I didn't expect the devs to make that choice for you so close to the end of the game. Edie does pull her weight though as she hacks her way through everything that needs hacking, including the redirection of a fighter jet to blow open a hangar door. Heading further in has Shepard coming across some logs of his resurrection process, which has him questioning who and what he is. 
I have to say, the fact that I didn't have to bring Tally really goes to show how much or little impact a scene can have depending on the choices that you've made. Sure, bringing Garrus, Liara, or Caden probably would have had them saying something along the same lines. I'm sure James would have said something semi-helpful and Javik would have told things how they were. But there's something to be said about the emotional bond which has formed between Shepard and his chosen partner, and how it affects even smaller dialogues like this. It's really great to see, and it makes me glad that I chose to bring Tally along for this endeavor. Maybe I'm just a high-tech VI that thinks it's Commander Shepard. But I don't know why. You are real. Real and mine. Further in, Edie's origins are also showcased. If you'll remember the mission in Mass Effect 1 where you wound up choosing a class specialization, the rogue AI on Earth's moon was what Edie was made out of. That mission fucking sucked, but it's pretty cool to see something like that linked this far into the third game of the trilogy. It's also revealed that Edie flooded Cerberus with 7 billion terabytes of porn when they tried to override the Normandy after Shepard broke away from Cerberus. I'm sure that was fun to deal with. Alright, so we make it to the elusive man's shelter, which is empty. The elusive man pops in over the comms to tell Shepard that everything that Cerberus is doing with the Reaper control stuff is for humanity and that it will propel humankind over every other alien race. And while this isn't a new motivation, I think this is a great place to talk about the elusive man, and what he is to this series. There are a lot of superheroic, downright saint-like people in Mass Effect's universe. Ones that can be described as pure and good and righteous. And most of the time, those good people are fighting against evil. Chaotic, life-destroying bad guys who only want death and destruction. It's about as black and white as you can get, and the elusive man runs right down the center of that. Imagine waking up one day and finding out that humanity has been contacted by alien life, that our galaxy is a lot smaller than we thought it was. Now imagine that that first contact led to a straight up futuristic space war, countless human lives lost against an alien threat. And when the pieces are picked up, it's revealed that humanity is now welcome to join these other alien races as the weakest of them the most looked down upon, the least important. That your people are eventually allowed to join the Council, but that you're still taken much less seriously than the Turians, Asari, and Salarians. Is it silly for a human to be mad at those races? To want more for humanity? And that's what the elusive man embodies. He is the essence of harboring those old grudges, those old wounds, and creating a vendetta against all of them. A vendetta that will hopefully lead to humanity's rise to the top, so that they aren't nearly destroyed by another species again. For as much as I like to personally try to treat every other race in this game pretty equally, I have the benefit of not living through that terrible conflict which darkens my optimism towards those races. With the elusive man presumably being at least as old as Anderson, who also lived through the first contact war against the Turians, I imagine his feelings are directly related to those days of uncertainty. And this is where the idea of Cerberus was born. In the first game, they were terrorists. In the second game, they were misunderstood. And in the third game, their desperation and indoctrination takes the wheel, causing them to drop all pretenses and to do whatever it took to make sure that the Reaper threat was not only curbed, but that it would elevate humanity to be able to take care of themselves against any threat that came their way. I'm not justifying everything that they've done but it is important to at least understand why these guys have been so ridiculously sacrificial in their approach in this game. Why they're everywhere, doing everything, letting their forces get destroyed over and over. Their fervor that took root in the fear of being buried turned into fanaticism, taking a very normal human feeling and amplifying it out of control. And this is what the devs wanted to convey with the elusive man and Cerberus being the main enemy besides the Reapers in this game. But all of that said, this is not the route that I hoped that they would take. In Mass Effect 2, Cerberus and the Elusive Man were introduced as a faction willing to do the hard stuff in order to accomplish their goals. They believed Shepard, listened to him, and they got shit done. They figured out how to take on the Collectors, where they came from, and how to eliminate them once and for all. All while the Council and the Alliance were fingering themselves. They worked outside of the rules for the express purpose of defending humanity and saving as many lives as possible. They weren't good guys, but they weren't evil by any means. And that was a beautiful faction to introduce into a galaxy where good faces down evil constantly. But that all changes in Mass Effect 3 with this idea that the elusive man has been twisted into the worst version of himself. 
and that his visions have been warped from putting humanity into a position of absolute power like the Protheans had, to doing anything and everything to control the Reapers no matter the cost. Whether by a time crunch or a lack of inspiration, the writers took this grey character and pushed him to be much closer to the dark end of the morality spectrum. And the biggest sin that this creates is that it's less interesting. It's less interesting fighting Cerberus at the AA gun facility, at the radio comms facility, at the bomb, at the science facility, and so on and so on and so on. They're gunning down random civilians now because, ah, they're evil bad people now. Indoctrinating the elusive man and pulling down Cerberus to become the exact evil terrorist organization that they were portrayed as in Mass Effect 1 is much more boring than the elusive man continuing to be that force of selfish grey that he always had been until now. Sure, he puts up the facade of still being in control, but so did Saren. It's clear that people retain a large fragment of their original personalities when indoctrinated. So him appearing to have it all figured out makes sense. I mean, like I mentioned earlier, nearly every single thing that Cerberus got involved in was immediately broken up and turned into a win for the Alliance. By continuing to toss men into the wood chipper, Cerberus indirectly prepared the Alliance better for that final battle. So why not run with that? Why not have the elusive man reveal that he knew what Cerberus's reputation was, and that he leaned into that to inadvertently help humanity by defaulting his positions repeatedly to the Alliance? He could have been a hero in his own way, as twisted as it was. Having his men take over various facilities so that the Alliance could then come take them over might have been a really cool way for the elusive man to use his reputation for good. But the devs decided that he needed to be evil now, and so you stopping him became one and the same with stopping the Reapers. What could have been a tactical choice was now turned into a byproduct of the elusive man now being a fanatical zealot who let the indoctrination get the better of him. It's just so lazy and makes him feel more like a cartoon villain than a good one. Either way, we rip the Prothean VI out to quiz it about the Catalyst, and it reveals that the Catalyst is the Citadel itself, and that the blueprints for the Crucible have been passed down from cycle to cycle, but that even when fully assembled, it needed the power of the Reapers to beat the Reapers. From the sounds of it, this lack of power has been proven in the past, meaning that the weapon has been deployed, it just didn't have that final kick to actually wipe the Reapers out. Now, it's safe to say that the Reapers are pretty damn smart, right? Remember when I pointed out that the Reapers have been really slow about invading the Citadel in this game? This is yet another reason why they might want to dismantle the damn thing before it can be used this way. I just don't get how these machine entities, which have always been a step ahead, are now suddenly lacking this much in logic. Again, it's been weeks since the start of the invasion, and they're still attacking Earth and other planets. They've had more than enough time to get to the Citadel. But this Prothean VI explains that the Reapers actually didn't know that we knew about the Catalyst being the Citadel. And now they do know because the indoctrinated elusive man has told them. And now they've suddenly attacked and moved the Citadel right next to Earth. Which is, like, right around where the Crucible is being built. They just... They just shoved it that way. Now you may be asking yourself, gee, why would they do that? The reason is because it would be easier to then start using their harvest of DNA immediately after finishing up with Earth to build a new Reaper. Because we all know that the Reapers have a short amount of time to get shit done and definitely care about efficiency. It's why they immediately attack the Citadel like they usually do, so that they could cut off every race from the Mass Effect relays so that those races couldn't band together and attack all at once. Yep, they definitely did that. So Kai Lang shows up after we're done, and the battle with him has Kai more or less being invincible until he tears up all of the floor. Then he goes down and Shepard just hops on the computer like nothing happened. I don't know if they rehearsed this, but Tally and Edie figure that the best thing to do is to look out the big window directly at the sun while Shepard has his back turned on Kai Lang. Big boy Kai gets back up and staggers over to Shepard before the renegade option lets Shepard react to him and he guts the guy. Why the fuck was this structured like every predictable Hollywood cliché ever? Whatever. Anyways, we take the Mass Effect relay to Earth. When we arrive, the plan is as follows. Big shooty flying guys attack the Reapers. Big shooty ground guys attack the Reapers, but on the ground. And the last floaty guys move the Crucible in when the ground guys take the space teleport beam up into the Covenant mothership and open its arms. What a plan. Alright, let's chat about the war assets. 
So in the original Mass Effect 3 system, war assets were handed out and enhanced through missions, side missions, scanning planets, a phone app that was tied into the game, and through multiplayer. By enhanced, I mean that you could gain your assets as usual through your questing. But they might not be as useful as they could be until you played some multiplayer or fucked around in the phone app. Now this readiness rating has been removed from the Legendary Edition, and thank fucking god. Because that was an awful forced mechanic back when I played. I don't believe the app even works anymore, so playing the original version and getting the best ending out of it would require multiplayer if that's still a thing that functions. But the Legendary Edition comes with its own set of problems. For one, you need somewhere in the ballpark of 7600 to 7800 war assets to unlock the best ending. Secondly, you'll need to play every game in the trilogy and make the correct choices while doing so. I never played the first game in the Legendary Edition, and that may have affected my final score because I wound up with just under 7,000 war assets. And I'm trying to figure out what I did wrong beyond not playing the first game in the Legendary Edition, because I completed every side quest to my knowledge besides finding Arya's couch for her on Omega. But I also didn't scan extra planets, and I think that that's probably where I went wrong. Now on one hand, I think it's kind of cool in a way that the ending is affected specifically by all of these little extra things that you can do in the series. And it sucks that I didn't get it here, but I'll bet that I would have felt pretty accomplished if I did. Still, doing nearly every side quest only to get told that you didn't do enough kind of feels... bad. And I wish the game would have said, you still have this amount of things to do in order to be fully ready. But I really can't fault it too much, it's just how the devs wanted to structure their game and I'm just upset that I didn't get the best ending. But I can still at least get one of the better ones. We'll get to that in a moment. The final set of battle cutscenes are absolute labors of love which unfold on screen. Brilliant displays of aerial space combat, gut-wrenching depictions of overwhelming odds, and a war for Earth that's nothing short of dramatic and heavy. You march through London while taking out an anti-air cannon before getting extracted to meet up with the rest of the ground forces. Cortez winds up crashing after dropping you off, presumably dying with the millions of others who have lost their lives fighting for this galaxy. It's a powerful mission, one that I appreciate the tone of greatly. But still, I know this place has been getting hammered. I just wish there was a little more to Earth than broken sci-fi buildings. It's not a huge complaint, it just kind of stuck out to me more when Big Ben was chilling in one of the scenes and it's like, oh yeah, this is Earth. You just don't really see the resemblance when you're fighting through it all, even if it is supposed to be futuristic. After the initial wave of fighting, there's a small interlude in which you can talk to every squad member in some capacity, saying your final goodbyes and the like. I won't bother recapping them all, but it feels like an appropriate send-off for all of the memories made when playing this series. I think I especially liked Garrus's goodbye, though Javik, Tally, Liara, and Edie were all really nice to get a final word from. When I'm through talking to everyone, it's time for one last speech from Shep before moving on to try to take back the Citadel. This next bit is non-stop action. I'm talking a fucking laser light show of a battle, which gets so bright and out of control that there was a point where I was just mashing buttons on my keyboard. I don't know what that says about melee combat, but I do know that it's still not the greatest. When we finally get some missiles off to take down this Reaper, reinforcements arrive just as the ground team is storming that beam of light. Because we're going off of movie logic instead of actual logic, the bad guys just keep that light beam on while the ground forces get this close. Eventually, a vehicle flips and nearly kills off Garrus and Tally, meaning that they've got an evac. Here, take her. Shepard! You gotta get out of here. I can't stay behind. Don't argue with me, Tally. Don't leave me behind. I need you to make it out of here alive, Tally. Get back to Rannick. Build yourself home. I have a home. Come back to me. Man, this scene kills me. They did a really good job at not making it cheesy here, which is a far cry from that introduction dialogue at the beginning of the game. Eventually, the Reaper thinks that it's killed everyone, and Shepard has to John Marston his way through this last bit here while crawling towards the light. When he gets to the other end, he's surrounded by viscera that looks a lot like what was going on at the Collector Base in the last game. As I mentioned before, with no Collector Base, this is the way that these guys have to make a new Reaper. So as you might have been able to gather, at this stage the game is leaning heavily into Hollywood sci-fi movie logic. The Reapers aren't being as methodically careful as they were in the past, 
Shepard somehow survives a laser beam which shredded his armor clean off. He's nearly dead when he climbs into the beam. It's just a lot of these don't think too hard about it type of scenes. And honestly, they are fun to watch if you manage to keep your brain from questioning certain strings of logic. All right, I think I've been pretty fair to the game and the devs at this stage. I feel like I've given them a decent amount of credit with this entire endeavor, because there is a lot that they've done right in my eyes. But that credit giving is going to stop now, because there's really only so long that you can keep your brain off and go along for the ride with this kind of shit. So you limp along through this part of the Citadel and Anderson has made it up here with you. But he's in a separate location and is slightly ahead of you. You would think that the Citadel being closed like this would make for some pretty cool scenery, but it looks like any other spacey, futury area in the game, just with some moving parts. When you make it to the only place that you can walk to, Anderson made it here before you. But oh no, they are trying to indoctrinate him. Do not give in to the reappers, Anderson. And then, the elusive man come into the room and tell them that he will control the Reaper. And Shepard say to him that it is elusive man that is controlled by the Reaper. And then the elusive man makes Shepard shoot Anderson with his super mind control takeover powers. You remember when this series treated indoctrination akin to a very slow and methodical perversion of a person's thoughts? where a person's motives begin to slowly corrupt into a path that benefited the Reapers, but you could still see how they got to that logic. Like, it used to be a secondary plot device that would explain odd behavior and betrayals. But then it gradually began to be treated more and more like a cop-out to just make people do evil things. I just... Like, fucking think about this for one goddamn moment. Shepard has literally been exposed to the most sources of indoctrination in the entire galaxy. There have been so many close encounters with these crazy devices and actual reapers, and every single time Shepard has resisted any sort of corruption. And now suddenly, the elusive man can just freeze Shepard and Anderson in place and make Shepard want to pull the trigger? I... I I just, I don't know, or he controlled his arm, something. Like, it's not indoctrination at this stage, it's literal puppetry. But they made this whole event look like the elusive man has the power to indoctrinate on touch. And the very act of indoctrination is now likened to someone just becoming evil for a brief amount of time. This whole game falls apart in the 11th hour because the writers became more focused on making it play out like a flashy movie rather than introducing the subtleties that the first game brought to the table. Everything has to be a real and tangible threat. I have to perceive that the elusive man is doing this to me. And the dialogue isn't much better. Every dialogue wheel gives me four options. One is red, one is blue. Why would I ever pick the gray options here? Is it even possible in this game to be locked out of both the red and blue options? I mean, honestly, I didn't go out of my way to make crazy Paragon or Renegade decisions, they just popped up and I literally always chose the option besides one time on Omega. That's not how this system should work. In what world do I get to the Elusive Man and not have these options available to me? In Mass Effect 1, when I made it to the first big Saren fight, I had one option to use a Paragon check to convince Saren that he was being controlled and it freaks him out so much that he allows the Reapers to experiment on him to further indoctrinate him. It felt like something that I earned. Like something that I saw because of the choices that I made. Meanwhile, the elusive man starts freaking out and completely breaks his confident character because I chose Paragon and Renegade options at random. I also caused Saren to shoot himself after making a very tough Paragon check, which wasn't something that everyone saw when they played. But that just happens here also with the elusive man because hey, what a throwback, am I right? You took every unique facet of the elusive man and said fuck it, because that's the more cinematic approach. It's absolutely embarrassing writing. And I honestly can't come up with a fix that wouldn't involve rewriting the majority of this game. The elusive man would have to not be controlled by the Reapers. Cerberus could have still been extremists, but one that you could eventually work with. Meaning that the Reapers would have to be that main threat that you wind up fighting repeatedly. Which makes for a less diverse enemy. You would have to have them control a couple of different groups to make up for a lack of variety. Maybe even forming a new faction of highly organized groups of dominated species. 
That would have introduced an even larger range of enemies to fight, which would have made the game more fun if you didn't know what you were going to run into on a planet that was overrun by indoctrinated forces. And that's just not the path that these guys went, which is an awful way to conclude this trilogy. After the elusive man brains himself, Anderson dies next to Shepard, and Shepard passes out on a lift that brings him up to the top level after Hackett tells him that the Crucible isn't doing anything. Now mind you, not only one, but two whole entry points from the Ray of Light led to this control panel area because, you know, that makes sense. When we make it to the top, the AI that the Leviathans created manifests itself in a form familiar to Shepard. In this case, it's the Snake Boy. It goes on to explain how it arrived at the conclusion that all life must be preserved in order to stop it from killing itself with AI, which we know about from the DLC. Of course, the vanilla game dialogue isn't changed too much, as you still have to ask who created the AI, which is then followed by Shepard awkwardly being able to state that he knows who created the AI. But even the vanilla dialogue has contradictions in it. When the topic of what the Reapers are comes up, the AI states that they're the amalgamation of all the knowledge of a particular cycle. They're the preservation of the information gathered, the wisdom of a species or multiple species. And yet, when you ask about the Crucible, the AI goes, Oh, that? Uh, yeah, we thought that shit was gone. But it turns out that it's not. Huh. Those crafty organics. Alright, let's get down to the infamous three flavor ending. Since its introduction, it has been patched to include more information as to what occurs in each ending. In addition to having a fourth ending where you just do nothing and let civilization get eradicated. The first one is the Destroy ending, which would cause all synthetics everywhere to just die off by using Mass Effect relays to EMP them more or less. This is the reason why AI is so much more focused on in this game. Growing close to Edie and saving the Geth from the Corians would be for nothing in this route. The AI also warns you that it would likely kill off people dependent on technology to live, such as Shepard himself who is basically a cyborg with all of his enhancements. The second ending is Control, which is what the elusive man sought to do. The way that the AI explains it is that Shepard would dissolve his physical body in a merge with the AI, in order to control the Reapers to benefit organics. Shepard would retain who he is, but his memories would likely be erased. So he could become a god, but not one who thought the same way that he does as a human. And the last ending is the one that the AI pushes towards as the optimal solution, Synthesis. Basically, instead of ascending as a god, Shepard can funnel his organic information into the Crucible and cause all life, both synthetic and organic, to merge into a single entity. The organics would gain the benefits of the vast amount of knowledge and power which synthetics have, and the synthetics would gain the understanding and humanity of organics. I chose this ending in my first playthrough because it was presented as the best ending to my limited knowledge at the time. But to get the quote-unquote best ending, you have to destroy. Of course, this is coupled with the stipulation of having the required amount of war assets. So let's go through what one of these endings look like, which I'll be choosing the destroy outcome for regardless of my war assets. So Shepard shoots the video game oil barrels which blow up as you might expect. This sends a current of red energy up the crucible to the closest Mass Effect relay, which then shoots out an EMP as it fires to the next relay. This EMP kills the Reapers and all of the Reaper forces, in addition to disabling all of the ships and electricity and all that. The Normandy tries to escape the blast before crash landing on a jungle planet. Everyone hops out of the ship and that's what the old ending looked like before the extended cut. Do you understand why people might have been a little upset? So what does the extended cut add? Well, there were a couple of scenes which were added earlier like these guys fighting husks or other planets watching the Reapers fall, which was pretty cool. Even some stuff from before the ending was added through the extended cut, like the option of your squad just getting incinerated in low war asset endings. And then the game has Hackett talking about how organics went on to be great people who cooperated. And there are these Fallout-esque stills of people whose lives we affected. But you know what Fallout does here that actually makes these still images worthwhile? It talks about the people. You know, Jack went on to continue teaching her students. Rex united his people and the boom of births caused the Krogans to get reinstated into the council races. Shit like that. That doesn't happen here. I have no idea what happened to these people beyond the stuff that I could have easily assessed based off of where we left them. You know what else Fallout does? It includes the bad stuff. You didn't save this town. 
this faction wound up perishing due to your actions. This raider group was left unchecked and robbed a granny at 6pm on a Friday afternoon. Mass Effect just tries to give you the tear-jerkiest feel-good ending that they could possibly muster. They don't mention that Tally probably almost died from infection when her suit stopped functioning after the EMP. They don't even talk about any of the Geth dying besides Legion. They don't mention that Joker probably spiraled into depression when Edie was eradicated. Like, why even have the AI tell you that your action to destroy will get rid of all technology for a little while, if there's no depiction of that after you do it? The only thing that the extended cut really adds of substance is watching Shepard's love interest place his plaque on the wall where fallen soldiers' names are. Can you fucking believe that the vanilla game didn't even have something like this? Like, what were they thinking? And this isn't even mentioning what happens in the other endings, which is where most of the ire came from in the first place. So I played through the ending again. Three more times, actually, though it was meant to be four. I just didn't want to go back for the war assets for the best ending. For the first round, I thought it would be funny to see if the AI would react to me taking a pot shot at it. Apparently, that just jump starts the ending where you fail and the cycle continues. That one just shows a hologram of Liara with all the information that she gathered and planted across the galaxy. Nothing particularly interesting by any stretch of the imagination, seeing as there were no new alien life forms or the like showcased. But you know what the most fucked up part about this ending is? Even this, the bad ending, has a feel good connotation to it. Because after the credits, the same type of snowy planet is shown that the Destroy ending had. And the dialogue is more or less unchanged, it just has an Asari type person talking to a girl instead of a human male talking to a boy. They fought a terrible war, so we wouldn't have to. And that's why we have peace. Yes. Without everything they accomplished, without the information they passed down, we too would be threatened. You've gotta be fucking kidding. This was the ending where you absolutely blew it. And they still wanted the player to feel like everything was right in the end. If there was ever a representation of a lack of player agency, this is it. So what about the control ending? Well, it's blue. I know that seems like such a meme way to say it, but good god was it true when this game released. The exact same scenes play, but with a blue filter. The Reapers up and leave. The Husks walk away. The Normandy still crash lands. Everything still happens the way that it did, basically. But the extended cut does do a little more for this ending. So instead of Hackett, it's Shepard talking. He talks about the man that he used to be, and how that man guides him now. The music has a much more ominous undertone, almost indicating that something's off. But nearly all of the stills are exactly the same, with the exception of one including the Geth and another showing Reapers in London, which I believe is a Kanye West song. But yeah, everything else is the same save for the monologue, which I do surprisingly appreciate. So what about Synthesis? Well, this one is by far the most drastic of the three flavors, at least it is now. Without the extended cut, we see the same stuff, but it's green. The ending has Joker bringing Edie out on the jungle planet that's now been infused with synthetic elements before they embrace in a sideways hug. With the extended cut, the various planetary fighting now ceases, with the formerly organic forces looking down in confusion instead of celebrating. It's a much different vibe. The end scenes suffer from looking terribly photoshopped, but they actually do add quite a few different slides that showcase humanity's merge into a better future for life everywhere. Edie appropriately narrates these changes, and it feels like the devs may have had this in mind as the real ending to some degree. I actually like it quite a bit more than I initially thought that I would, though the extended cut is doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Did that all really happen? My brother in Christ, look at your body! You see that wavy green shit? Of course it's all true. Are you fucking kidding me? Organics and synthetics merge and this is the intelligence we produce. And the best ending which I didn't get is literally the destroy ending, but it shows Shepard taking a breath as if he were still alive in the rubble. Which should really go to show you not only what the devs were going for in terms of pulling at the heartstrings, but what the fans wanted as well. I mean, this has literally been dubbed the best ending. I don't think Bioware refers to it as the best ending anywhere. It's just referred to as the best ending everywhere that I've looked it up online. But it does nothing different beyond showing that Shep is alive. Should he be after all that? 
Some of the best shows and films I've ever seen has the good guy dying after insurmountable odds are faced because it grounds the media in reality. It makes you feel like shit, but it's a good feeling. It's a somber tone that overshadows a sacrifice. But people want to see the hero live, and it's up to the writers to let that happen when they've given their best. Giving into that feeling of, well, they'll want to see him live, so we're just gonna make it the hardest ending to obtain, just steamrolls the idea that Shepard was a heroic human who gave everything so that the rest could live. I don't know, it just cheapens this idea that this was his last hurrah to me. But I know that this is probably a minority opinion. The big sin that the ending of this trilogy commits here is that it takes a lot of the choices, both little and major, which the player chose throughout these games and just rolls over them. It causes them to not matter, to be forgotten. And that's a problem when creating a series that promises what Mass Effect promised. No matter how big the budget, there's never going to be enough time in this world where publishers force their developers to push out sequels within one to two years. Color-coded endings are chosen because that's the more budget-friendly route. Choices are swept away because there's no time to fit the ripples that they've created into the final product. And I don't think that there's a feasible way to create a fully voiced, top-of-the-line graphics video game that has choices that extend through multiple games, all of which affect the tiniest details in the very last scene. It's too much to ask for in this day and age, at least when a big publisher is pressuring their developers to perform, to overwork their employees, and to deliver a product that sells no matter what. And I'm not saying that there was no cause for outrage or disappointment. There clearly was when Bioware promised that the trilogy's endings wouldn't come down to a cut-and-dry choice at the end. But there could have been a compromise, some honesty about how difficult of an undertaking this kind of thing would truly be. The thing that really popped into my head was the lack of aftermath narration from the extended cut slideshow. I mean, how hard would that have been to implement? Fallout has been coasting on it for decades now, and it's still something that people look forward to when they finish games in that series. But Bioware pulled a CDPR long before CDPR did, and told the fans that they would get everything that they wanted. They promised that every one of their choices would matter. And yes, of course, that's a large undertaking. I do think that they did well to make up for a lack of choices mattering with the DLC. But you know what really bugs me? Mass Effect 2 could have easily not existed with the way that they treated all of the characters that came from that entry in 3. The elusive man being set up as a grey force of human pride, nearly every single squad mate save for the ones that came from the first game just being included as token side plots, the collectors being introduced as a threat and then thrown out the airlock in the same game, and so on and so forth. These plot points fundamentally did not matter in the grand scheme of things. Sure, they added flavor. Yes, I liked a lot of the people who made their first appearance in 2. Yes, I liked Mass Effect 2 in general. I'm not saying it didn't need to exist, but it could have not existed. And that's not a great way to structure a trilogy. It would be like if Star Wars Episode V had Luke and the gang stopping an offshoot of the Empire who only showed up in that episode before going back to take on the main threat in Episode VI. They meet Mr. Gerberbean, who's a great character that everyone loves. They head to the lovely planet of Orkers, where a strange fog has been unleashed by the bad guys who aren't the Empire. And they wrap up all of these new characters and locations just in time for the Empire to strike back. I mean, sure, it would have been fun, but would it have mattered in the overall plot? No, not really. And this is where Mass Effect 3 cheapens the rest of the series with how it approached everything. While I initially thought that there were some cool consequences revolving around the Rachni Queen, around Grunt leading his squad, Jack teaching, and so on, everything got translated to numbers which affect the ending. Oh, you did this cool thing in the first game? Plus 100 social credit. You fucked up this part of the second game? Minus 50 social credit. And that isn't a horrible way to approach things. I mean, you feel rewarded when certain consequences catch up to you in the last entry. But after the initial appearance of these characters, you don't really see what they do when everything is over. Slides that only show vague pictures of what occurred after seems like the worst way to approach trying to make up for the previous ending because they only represent an idea that very obviously should have been expanded further. I mentioned this a couple of times throughout the script, but a lot of Mass Effect 3's big plot points rely on super specific circumstances that almost seem contrived to a point where you start to look at how reasonable they are. The bridge example when we were trying to cure the genophage was the first one to bug me just because there were so many different ways that it could have been approached more naturally. 
with the way that this scenario was handled, we have to assume multiple things. 1. The Krogans plotted out a route through Gary, Indiana, and were surprised when the infrastructure was collapsed. 2. They only built one road through here, so if something like this happened, there was literally no other way to progress since we were now high up on a bridge-like structure. And 3. The Turians claimed that they were locked in to fight with their air support because the Reaper just noticed them. But couldn't they just fly the fuck away? I mean, if the Reaper chases them, then we win because we needed the Shroud cleared. And all of these issues pop up at once when the climax of Act 1 begins. This would have been no problem if the Krogans chose to do something drastic like launching their convoy off of the bridge to attempt to make it to the Reaper through the dusty wasteland. But as things stand, they stop their trucks, the Turian pilot hits them, and then the two most important trucks cross the collapsed part anyways. So you go from thinking, oh shit, what are they going to do? To, oh, well this was just a plot device to make sure that we didn't show up with an army of Krogans. This example can be applied to every other issue that I had with the plot. This place has been destroyed and one character tries to kill themselves because that's dramatic. Metagel can't be used on this guy because Shepard's gotta do it. And he just didn't feel like it right then. This guy can't be fired at during a cutscene because this guy has to die. That same guy can't be defeated here because losing to him is dramatic. This guy is completely evil now, stop him. It takes the most nuanced parts of the Mass Effect universe and boils them down to contrivances with the express purpose of making the player feel this emotion or that emotion. It's exactly how I see a lot of mainstream movies, which is something that I brought up a lot when I kept saying that this was a very Hollywood moment. And it's why I don't care for those most of the time. The dialogue choices that you make, the Paragon and Renegade actions, every little decision that you have outside of the major ones, all of it is so lackluster that they may as well not even be taken into consideration anymore. Their identities have been lost, the parts of the series that made it special have been stripped away, and that's made clear immediately with stuff like combat. The clunkiness of the combat system was something that really bogged down the game for me at times. It is something that I got used to eventually, but that doesn't make it a better system. The thing is, I could see the embers of something better in it, as I do believe that if you're going to go full action, then this is at least the beginnings of what that should be. But it's clear that even in the last game of the trilogy, these guys are still trying to figure out hitboxes, pathing, and the fluidity of movement. Additionally, oftentimes the amount of health or shield regen don't seem to matter when it comes to certain enemies. If you run out of shield and don't have tons of health, a bigger enemy is liable to pick you up and rip out your spine even if your shields recharge to full during this process, which isn't an ideal way of representing insta-kills. Even out of combat, the rigidity of the game's movement becomes painfully obvious. One time I actually got stuck on this bug creature's hitbox on the Citadel, and I had to reload to get out of it. That shouldn't be happening, and even though it's the biggest example, this kind of thing did happen occasionally. The developers went from seemingly having a very clear idea of what they wanted to do with this series, a route that fused those traditional RPG elements with a bit of action. One that took player agency and let them run with it to create the Shepard that they wanted, who affected the galaxy the way that they envisioned. And as the series grew, those ideas shrank. Combat was revamped. Choices were stripped away. Morality actions became something that anyone could perform. They exchanged the charm of a system that harkened back to older role-playing games for a shiny new action game that had a heavy plotline. Things didn't need to be explained as well. They just needed to look good first and foremost. And that fucking sucks, man. I have no other way to say it, but... <sighs> Is Mass Effect 3 as bad as I remember? No, it really isn't. It has so many shortcomings, so many areas where it falls flat and makes me wish that the game had turned out differently, but it really isn't a bad game in the slightest. It does so many things right. It brings out so many emotions in me. It takes these lovable characters that I've gotten to know and understand and it gives many of them a future in both the series and in my heart. It has such high highs that it's impossible for me to say that I dislike it anymore. I had so many good experiences with the game for about 85 to 90% of my playthrough. It's just that last 10 to 15%, most of which was backloaded at the very end to leave a sour taste in my mouth. I love this series, and that includes this game. 
I just wanted more for it. And I know the DLC did a lot to help that opinion. I could keep going. I could explain what made this game so important to me again, but I don't want to any more than I already have. This video turned out so much more positively than I ever thought that it would, and I like to think that I expressed that a fair amount by the stage. So while I can sit here and let these negative emotions guide my overall judgment of this game like I used to, I'm not going to. It's been a long road with this trilogy for me. From the first time that I fired it up on my Xbox 360 to re-experiencing it in the Legendary Edition. I know they're cooking up another game and I honestly wish the best for it. I'm scared of those elements that hurt Mass Effect 3 showing up in it, but I just gotta hope at this stage. For now, I'm just glad that I'm done talking about these games for a little while longer at least. Thanks for watching. I knew this was gonna be long, but Christ. It's been a lot more fun than I thought it would be, honestly, and I'm really happy to be through with this part of the series. I'm unsure what I'll cook up next, but I've got plans. Big plans. Until then though, I've got merch over at my merch shop if that's still running. Uh, yep, looks like it is. I've got a Twitch where I stream nearly every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I've got a Twitter where tweets are tweeted. I've got a Discord where chords are dissed. And I've got a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.